please leave a message after the tone. Seven questions do Your life is going down the tubes What do you do When you need advice Rick, it's good Good night What am I fighting for? So turn down the lights Pick up the phone And leave a message for the new class Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Nude Clan After Dark. Today, guys, we're going to be doing something a little bit differently. We're going to start our monthly review of a book from our Yeah, we should probably get like a a different introduction thing for for at least this. uh, Yeah, we could. For our gay little book club that we're doing. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we we should get someone to uh, record a new intro song for us. Yeah. Gay, it has to be a little bit more sultry, a little, little more sultry, a <laughs> little more like, you know, makes you think of erotica. Let's just try that. You know, erotica book club. And that's yeah. not going to be what it is, apparently. Yeah. Well, Especially with our first book that we started with. I mean, you could see it. I as, mean, yeah. I mean, you, you could, could. You could. If you were playing Civilization and you got that done, you'd, it'd be, you'd probably have a boner. Conquering uh, erotica. Yeah. <laughs> Conquering <laughs> domination. Eurasia erotica, but. the ultimate orgy. Yeah. So today, guys, we're going to be reviewing, as you can tell from the episode title, the making of the Genghis Khan and the making of a modern of the modern world. Jesus. Um, yeah, it's a crazy, different take on Genghis Khan's life and his um, legacy, and like what he left behind, what he changed for the modern world. Obviously, based on the title. Uh, this is a an audible. Is it an audible original or is it just only no. an audible digitally? I'm pretty sure there's physical copies because uh, somebody on Discord was telling me they have it on their shelf. Oh, I guess uh, that would... only from Audible. Maybe Audible is the only one who has the digital copy or the audiobook copy. That would make sense. I'm pretty sure they have like some that they specifically produce, and so they put that. Uh, that little tagline on there. Yeah, so the book came out. Um, it was it's written by Jack Weatherford, and it came out in March of two thousand four. So it's been a while, and I, I guess they part of it is sort of kind of centers around like the Mongol history that they found. Like, did they find that? Because it like it was yeah, like, the, really vague um, about it's uh, it's the, the secret, secret history. The secret history of isn't the that also available. Um, I don't think so. The secret history of the Mongols. Yeah, there's um, like some. Yeah, kind no, of... it's a $30 book on Amazon. Oh. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say, I think they translated all of it. That's because I was looking into it because I. Uh... The secret history of the Mongols is the oldest surviving literary work in the Mongol Mongolian language. Yeah, there you go. So there's a lot more to the story um, than the, the pillaging and raping. I mean, there's that too, obviously, but. I mean, and also another thing you have to, less to know is, um, you know, a lot of these people will take uh, creative liberty when writing these histories. A lot of mysticism is involved as well. But it is, of course, the best um, text that we, we can get, you know, from those times. So Yeah, yeah. So you've got to realize some of it's like ridiculous and even the guy who was writing this realized that for like yeah said hey and so so when you're reading when you're reading a book like um the making of the modern world yes it's some of the viewpoints will be swayed by you know the person who wrote the book um but they will you know check this source and they'll you know cross check it against other sources from that same time from other cities um and really try to present um a well-rounded account of what happened or could have happened during those times. And that's why I really fucking love this book, Genghis Khan, Making of the Modern World. It's been one of my favorite books for quite some time. I did read it um, originally like a few years ago. And then I've talked to you guys about it occasionally. And I'm super happy got to read it again. It's yeah, you good. know, I uh, 
sometimes history books can be kind of dull, but this one was really interesting the whole time. Right. Like, I, I really enjoyed the way he went about it, because it has, like, three different sections, you know? He's like, hey, this is, like, this is Genghis Khan. This is kind of, like, what happened afterwards. And then, like, this section, the last section is basically, like, this is the after effects of, like, mm-hmm. what happened. Of how it really kind of like set down, I guess, you know, the base of a lot of things that we take for granted today. They yeah. really set down the base of the modern world. Um, I got into this book um, because I listened to the only podcaster that I listened to is Dan Carlin, and he does these um, really in-depth history series. And he did one on Genghis Khan, one of his source materials, and he was, you know, that he read that he um, suggested was Genghis Khan: The Making of the Modern World. But if you do like listening to podcasts, I suggest listening to Dan Carlin's um, Genghis Khan series. I can't quite remember the title of them, but. He does. A, he's also great. He's really good at it's opening like up an idea. Wrath of the Mongols, or something, yeah, Wrath isn't of the it? Mongols. He's really good at really presenting an idea and being engaging, entertaining. Like he should do audiobooks too. Yeah. Well, the problem if he did that, he would only do one every like seven months. That's the thing. Yeah, yeah. it takes him so fucking long these days to get stuff out, and he even stopped his uh, other uh, branch off podcast where he would do com- uh, common sense is what he called it, but it would be a, a political commentary of current events of what's going on. But as about halfway through uh, Trump's presidency, he stopped doing it just because it was hard. Number one, people you know both sides would always get mad at him, and. Um, it's just like events were happening too quickly to really come out with a timely episode and things have already developed further. Yeah, so, they've already switched to the next thing. Yeah, so he kind of stopped. I don't know if he'll start again, but I really like those as well. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I feel like one of the things that this book does really well is it like brings the reality of these situations into you know into more account than we do traditionally now. Because now we think about it as like, you know, yeah, he, there was a lot of fighting and there was a lot of, like, turmoil and stuff during him taking over. But then after that, I mean, it was it's it, it was extremely peaceful and, like, it was it's very similar to what Rome did, except for even more, even less intense than what Rome did in a lot of ways. Uh, because they they he focused mostly on taking out the leaders and um, so one thing that the book does go into detail. I don't even know if we have one format for this like did we know not really format? Yeah. we're just going to start talking about the book um yeah so i mean yeah he would take out the leaders and his one thing is yeah he's going to eliminate the rich in most of these cities because he saw there was no use for them they were usually not very talented in other things and he didn't want the people you know finding you know, putting their support into, you know, these other rich aristocrats to, you know, to revolt later. Um, But his one thing that he did do that was super brutal was if a city resisted him, he would fucking dominate that city and uh, send out the peasants before him to be, you know, the fodder for the next attack. Yeah. He just slaughtered tons of people that way. Yeah. Which is, you know, for that time, it was a huge, you know, winning tactic. Um, but I don't have any accounts of Romans, you know, on mass slaying, you know, entire cities like that. Yeah. And they did a little bit, but it wasn't, it wasn't any like big cities. And then they also tended to be super emotional. And so when one of his sons died in a campaign against the city, um, he let his, his son's wife decide the fate of the city, and so they. She's like, "Well, let's kill every man, woman, and child, and animal within the city. Just fucking destroyed it because they killed my husband." So, I mean, the Raised war the tactics ground. and the domination is super fucking brutal, but it it's what really comes after that that people tend to glaze over. Yeah, yeah, and it's not that it wasn't brutal. I mean, no one's saying that it wasn't brutal. It's it's just that they're i don't know these things these these great works always come at a cost right like this great amount of peace that was brought like the the pyramids being built like all of these things cost like an immense amount of time yeah. and manpower yeah and you know potentially slaves but well mongols sold slaves too exactly yeah so like um, you you have to realize that 
But it's also a product of the time as well. It is in a lot of I ways. I mean, who isn't selling slaves these days, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, <clears throat> they didn't even like look at it as selling slaves either because they they were just like servants to them. They didn't really have yeah, a concept so they, of slavery. Until, they didn't have a like, concept they were introduced to the other guys. of slavery, but they also viewed the you know the peasants and stuff like that they viewed them as they would cattle yeah, yeah lesser so, lesser beings lower, um lower conscience. but before we get in too far uh too much further craig has some well, some stuff some that he brought this Whoa. might be is this going to become a, a tradition guys that we uh bring a new whiskey every time so good. after uh you guys can make that a tradition i don't <laughs> so after I brought some. It really sparked something in Craig, and he had to immediately uh, go out and buy some whiskey for himself. So what would you get, Craig? Oh, I got some uh, some Johnny Walker Black Label, mm. aged 12 years. You know, some, uh, hey, some man, if it bleeds, it, from, it, from it drinks, I guess. <laughs> it's 12 years old. It's fine. That's, uh, <laughs> how old was the one we had last time? It was like 10, right? Was that no. So we had several Cam last time. The Black so, uh, so Ugadol, I don't know how aged that I think, is. I think the one we're getting today is aged longer, right? No. Yeah. Wait, what? You said the... Okay, so was... we had three that we had last time. The Red Breast was a 12-year. The Bullet was a three-year. Um, and then Ugadol, I don't know. It could be just a mix with their 10-year. Mm-hmm. All right, so we're going to start off with the Johnny Walker. There's your little Black label. Yeah, it's perfect. (laughs) His little Stein shot glass. Love it. All right. Yeah, we got Cameron a full, full glass so that he can go ham. Not that I mean he's the one that has to. Yeah, Ugadol is uh, is a ten year, so they probably take their stock from their just their normal Ardbeg ten year, and they probably just mix it with other stuff. But the whiskey itself stopped aging. No, I time. think I know what they do. They they put it out to sea, and then they burn the fucking ship down. It's like a wooden <laughs> ship, and then whatever barrels make it back or what it tastes well, like because it's super it has the sea breeze, and it has the fucking smoke hell. Drink it first, and then. They I mean, just, all like, you had those casts was the in a was net the over the, the fire the Ugadol, which is super fucking smoky. But wait till you have that fucking ten year. Yeah, am I gonna be it, like billowing smoke like smog yeah, out of my dude, fucking nostrils? It, <laughs> it has a <laughs> right. Wow, that is super fucking smooth. Ah, uh, super what? Fucking smooth. That Johnny Walker Black Label. Ugh. I didn't really get too much taste off of it, though. It is a little bit cold from your car. Probably, yeah. It's been out there for like an hour or so. The initial taste is really gross. You know, it's it's funny. Like, I was actually um, looking into this. When things are colder, um, you can't taste taste them as well. It's when things are room temperature is when you can actually get the full flavor. Yeah, that's why you never drink uh, Outer Darkness when it's not ice cold because you don't want to taste the full flavor. <laughs> right, and so that's why it's a thing when uh, cheaper beers are always served super fucking cold because you don't get as much of the flavor, and which is why in America you usually don't drink warmer beer because it's disgusting. Yeah. You don't want it warm. Yeah, no, I like it. It's super smooth. Um, again, it's just a little cold, but... I'm not really getting anything more than. Uh, do you taste smoke in sweetness. the aftertaste? Mm, not really. Because I do, but I, I, I maybe I smell the other one. Yeah, I'm not really getting any smoke in the black label. Or maybe I'm just, just like, like a. It's like if Crown Royal was good, almost. Yeah, yeah. If it was good, it would probably be like that. <laughs> if Crown Royal wasn't for poor people, it would be. It would taste like this. No, yeah, it's yeah, that's no, good. It's not bad. Okay, yeah, it's a little like that uh, that bullet stuff you had. Um, bullets a little bit sharper. The rye in the bullet is it gives it a much like sharper flavor, but the base of it is good. But whereas the bullet is a bourbon, and this is a blended Scotch whiskey. Yeah, 
Yeah. And then since it's blended, it says age 12 years. That means the youngest barrel or the youngest whiskey has to be 12 years, but there could be something aged more than 12 years in it. But yeah, no, I like it. So I guess what kind of format did we want to review books in? How are we going to do it? I don't know. I just think talking about the major points. Um, okay. And the major ideas, I think, would be cooler than anything. This, yeah, this book definitely um, splits it in half almost, where the first portion, half of the book, well, is like about Genghis Khan. Sections. Okay, actually, yeah, you're right. Three distinct sections. Genghis, Genghis Khan uniting the um, Mongol people, Mongols conquering the world, and then what did the Mongols do after they conquered the world? Yeah. So let's kind of hit that first part, I guess, how he grew up. Yeah, um, so he grew up very brutally, as you can expect. I mean, people were starving. Um, it was hard to live. His father uh, was... It, it, it starts out with like his mom getting kidnapped by some random hunter so that he could take her as like his second wife. Yeah. And so, like... Uh, and she, in apparently... order to like let her newly her new husband like get away, she basically was like, "Hey, just fuck off and you know marry someone else." Because because yeah, apparently kidnapping was a was a thing in Mongol society, and then Mongols didn't put any honor in staying to fight and die, because it would often say if you're getting if you know if you were getting ambushed or attacked that the men would flee first because if the men stayed the men would be killed. So there was nothing wrong in that society about all the men fucking just bailing as soon as they can, yeah. letting the the invaders take what they want and then come back and then if you can try to mount a expedition against yeah, them to restore a, your lost a goods. High value on life. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's actually very different. It is. It's different from what we know and it's different from what you would expect based right. on some of their actions right they yeah and i think that makes a lot of sense because you can still win the war and you know run from a few battles if you have to it's better exactly. to do that than to just stay and get slaughtered and so yeah there were they didn't put any honor in store of yes it's your wife um but they put your and your life is more valued over over that so. yeah because you can't do anything to help her later if you die now like yeah. if you're completely outnumbered and under underpowered like what are you gonna do right you're just gonna lose and so in this case she told the young warrior hey um just leave you'll find another wife it'll be fine and so yeah she was kidnapped by can't remember any of their names besides uh genghis's oh, his, name his name was like it started with a y i remember that because they made a comparison to yeah, like it being similar to their their name for jesus yeah it was something like that but anyway, he should get kidnapped by another tribe. Imagine. Yeah, um, that was his wife, right? That was his bride to be. Yeah, so um, he was. Yeah, that was his wife. Yeah, she gets and kidnapped and then his, taken to the southern. Yeah, yeah, they take her for a long time too, and like he knows where she's at, but he can't. I mean, they basically he take her do. forever. I mean, that's where yeah. she gets impregnated and has um, Tamo Chin. Yeah, yeah, and uh, who is you know the star of the story? Yeah. Was his was his dad's wife kidnapped too? I don't remember that. I remember Genghis's wife being. Yeah, Genghis's it, wife it, was. Very, it yeah. starts the very beginning with his mom being his kidnapped. mom. Yeah, oh, so we okay. were just relating. So they the, were. Yeah. They basically went over how like the culture was. Um, the the men would be would, in order to get a wife, they'd have to like go work for the potential wife's family for yeah, a certain yeah, yeah. amount of time, and so this guy did that. Um, in this village that was known for their beautiful women, and like as he was taking her back to his village, they were spotted, and she got kidnapped. Oh yeah, that's right. And, um, and so she was taken to be his th- this other dude's second wife, so she had to work extra hard to like earn her place in the family because right. she wasn't just like immediately in it. Yeah, and then eventually his dad got him back. No, I think, no, right? No, or no, he, he did, escaped. He just, huh? No, so no, that, that that's his happen. life. That's that, his family. Then that the that kid. So yeah. later, you do see that other tribe. You know, stri- You know, try to make you know retribution against Genghis, and that's what happens when Genghis's wife is kidnapped. It's by the original tribe that they know that. Um, oh yeah, his yeah. mother was stolen from, and so they came back and tried to steal his Genghis's uh, wife, and he was able to get her back. 
Um, well, I thought he escaped and went back to his people, though. No, that mean no. that is his people. The, the, okay, so he <laughs> does. He does get. Uh, he does get captured when he's a kid after he kills his brother. Uh, his, he kills his older brother to take his place after his father dies because he gets poisoned. Like, and his father is the one who kidnapped his mother. Yeah, and oh, that's okay. just his family at that point. Got it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and okay. so he escapes like the slavery that happened for an unknown number of years. Yeah, and so the father uh, is returns to his is tribe. killed later for something, and then it's him, his brother, his half brother, and I think others too. But it's really just them and their mom. Yeah, and they're and left then alone. now they're now they're left to try to survive in the step land, and they're hunting small rats and other game to get by. And then it's when they're all starting to get a little bit older and are able to hunt down larger game. Yeah. Um, the so the whole time that I was that I was listening to the part where they they had to like survive and like yeah you know get their shit together and start really building stuff. Oh my god, twice. All all I could think about was that Conan Exiles. Man. Yeah. I was like, fuck, this is perfect. This is exactly what Conan is. And then that's when they started getting older and then his half-brother, the one who came from the father originally, he's a little bit older. That's when he starts to try to exercise authority over um, Timochin and his, his his name was Timochin before Genghis, right? Yeah. 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 Um, that's when he starts to try to exercise authority over them both and that just doesn't sit right with him he's like mm, I don't it's, like I think it's because of the more the way he did it yeah. bit, rather than him just doing well, it well it's it's funny because he bullied him with it traditionally that is how it's supposed to be yeah. and yeah so he would steal you know rabbits and stuff from Demochen as he would hunt it and stuff like that and then and, you know when he like hey I don't like him doing this his mom was like nope I mean that's how it is and he's like well Gotta it's not even my, my full brother and she's like too bad well, the thing that I thought was interesting was like he and his brother were responsible for feeding like him and his his mom and his sister, so like the their step older brother, and you know them taking their food, was basically being like, hey, you guys aren't gonna fucking eat. Yeah, and so that's why that's one of the reasons why he was like, hey, this is fucked up. Well, it's funny but though. It was under his like his complete right to do it. Yeah, it's funny what he just decides to like get rid of in his society because a lot of the stuff he doesn't stand anymore. This is one of the things that makes him like a revolutionary character, right? He, <clears throat> this is the idea. The idea is that like the firstborn is the, the word and the law, right? And his, his will goes, but he wasn't having any of that. But it's funny yeah. because he also later on their society does a lot of like group identity stuff, which is one of the only things I don't like about, them but i mean their society is so different that it's not the even idea, anywhere near what their their idea behind it was kind of interesting though yeah the idea makes sense it, because it's like it's like well if the whole group is going to get punished for one person then that means that they're going to keep that one person in line yeah which in a sense makes uh, it makes sense in in the in the idea that they didn't really have a, a policing force and yeah, so they yeah. couldn't really like keep anything like that under under strict law. Yeah, and so, and family the matters were always handled within the family unless like it became a huge thing where the state had to step in. Yeah, exactly. So I that's why it makes sense for them as opposed to us. A side note, um not to the story, but about the Johnny Walker is that yes, there is supposed to be a slight smoky finish, but I can't, I can't taste it. Um, but what I am tasting, which is not here in the tasting notes that I can see is I, I taste a little bit of apple out of it. I don't know why you got apple in the black label. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. I definitely got the smoke as I like breathe onto my mic and then smelled. It's supposed like, to be oh, tropical kind of dark fruits with hint of sweet vanilla, but I just got a fucking apple. Um, but anyways, back to the story. Um, so he doesn't stand for it, and so he, so Temuchin and his brother stalk their their older brother, their half brother, um, and then basically confront him and slay him and kill him. Yeah, and this is like the beginning of Temujin's mastery of like uh, strategy because the way in the story, at least the way that he killed him is like he knew that his brother was better. Was he better was a shot. better shot than he was? Yeah. yeah. Um, but he had a better chance of like taking him if he didn't die or something like that. So he had his brother, you know, go from a certain angle and from the front. A, yeah, he was behind mm -hmm. him, and uh, I don't know. It just shows that like one of the things that people, it's so dumb. Like everyone is convinced that like 
a lot of people anyway are convinced that like pure power is the only thing that people it's like the one thing that rules everything we'll see this later that there's a lot of what genghis did that revolutionized the mongol yeah, culture cause and really set into place like almost a modern political society yeah and it's the it's based on the idea that he's doesn't have to be the best at everything he right. just has to be the best at organizing everyone that is right. the best at everything and that's exactly what he does yep and that's and that just means he's smart you know what i mean that yeah. doesn't mean he's like you don't have to be super powerful to run things like that. You just have to be smart and know when you're not the best. And he immediately did that from the very beginning of the story. Yep. And so they kill his half-brother. And then Mongols, they, well, this will happen over and over again in the story. They have this really weird thing about death. They don't like to watch people die. They don't like to finish people off. And then to get blood on you, to get their blood on you, is very like an, an impure thing to do. Yeah. yeah. They didn't like talking about uh, death or blood or and anything so like that. And so oftentimes like taboo. when someone's mortally wounded, did they leave him alone to die yeah and so that's what they did uh he shot his brother in the back um and they left him to die and then his mom knew immediately and there's this thing about when he was well, born he was, was holding also onto a, like a, a blood clot she's like oh this is a bad omen you'll be alone forever blah 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 and he's yeah. like i'll fuck more women than you've ever seen <laughs> Uh, one of the interesting things is like it was a it was a taboo to like return to a place where you killed somebody. And yeah. So like they had to like avoid that specific spot for like ten something years or as long as the there was any evidence that that body was there. Yeah. The step land's Which a dry place. Really Bones will remain for quite some time. Yeah. But um, yeah. So blood symbols of death and stuff like that, and you'll see that later that if you show them that shit, they just. They don't like that's a very impure and they will cleanse the fuck out of your city if you do it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They that was a taunt that they didn't they didn't take very lightly. Um so I don't think we need to talk about every huge thing, just like major just major events. Um I feel like that's when he first got control of his um little family. They progressed and stuff like that. Then he went to go work for his wife and put in some time. That was actually before his dad died. To work for his wife? Mm-hmm. I thought that was after. No. So what happened was uh, his, his dad... I thought they killed his brother his dad, super No, his dad, his dad wanted to separate him from his older brother because he knew okay. there was going to be a rivalry. No, so he, so he went to him, go work for his wife, but then he was trying to, but then he gave up that first time, I'm pretty sure. Uh, oh, you mean to look for her? No, uh, I, I didn't. He go to you know put in some time to work for a wife. No, but then yeah, he, he didn't it's like where he met what was Porta happening or whatever her name is. Like he he his father like set him up with that chick because they were going to go to another town. But like they, I thought they, that didn't they were work friendly. out because something happened and then he it just didn't bailed. work out because the he came across like this band of dudes that. Um, he had fought before, and they poisoned him. Yeah, and, and then so he like, just bailed. And so like, did he after, bail with Borta? After a certain amount of time, he had to come back to his dad. Okay. Um, but yeah, he did spend some time working for uh, their family. Okay, but then didn't he go back after this? Yeah, he went and searched for her, but he didn't do any more work for them. And but that's when he kind of um, he found Borta and tried to set up her. his tribe with the, that you know that tribe, and then. They were working together, and he was, you know, taking care of, you know, the horses and stuff. Yeah. And then he split off with his family from them later. Yeah. Um, and then he almost got invaded, so he's like, okay, we need to, like, you know, get with a bigger band. And so they found another bigger band and started doing work uh, with them until eventually... Yeah, he, he met with his... Uh with his spiritual father or whatever. I can't remember what they called it. Like the, the, uh, he, he was like a blood brother with his, yep. his dad. So he like, went so he, and, yeah, he found when he got married, friend. he gave him like the gift of the black sable coat, which was traditionally given to their father. And so like, if he accepted it, he means that he was like accepting Genghis as his son. Right. And, and, and then so, what like, was they, they his, the, his blood the brother's name? <sighs> Can't remember. Jamoka, J- <laughs> Jamaku, something like that. I can't remember. Jamoka, yeah. um, Jamoka shake. Jamoka. Yeah. Ooh, I Jamoka wanna Khan. take ya. And so apparently, having a blood brother is a closer or should be a closer tie than ac- having you know an actual an brother. actual brother, just because you choose them, and it does involve swapping blood and then sharing a tent for a while. Yeah, the same Gary. You have, to, you have to sleep under the stars with the same blanket. Yeah, yeah. Fucking homoerotic. 
but yeah, no. Um, so <laughs> he has this really close brother, and um, they would trade gifts, arrowheads, and stuff like that. Um, They'd he, fuck each other every so they, often. They, they you know. trade a whistling arrowhead. The blood brother thing, like three times, <laughs> like twice as children, and then once as adults. They yeah. occasionally trade skin flutes. You know, <laughs> you know, you know how it is. <laughs> Uh, why haven't we done that, guys? Yeah, why, why haven't we? Why haven't we, we did, slept together we under a blanket week. under the stars and shared? We've, skin we've, we've shared a tent under the stars. We did, yeah, but yeah. we haven't shared a blanket. No, no, we all had separate, very distinctly separate blankets. No. Uh, some of us like to break those distinctions a little and be spooning, but not all. <laughs> the others just just cower and 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 well, they just sleep. But yeah, you know. Um... <laughs> yeah. Did we? I, I you, did. you weren't. You were not. I was there. asleep. <laughs> That's okay. how I woke up. That's how he woke up. <laughs> yeah. When you tried to spoon him, just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. It was, I, was a, I mean, I've never really been the little spoon. Have you ever it's seen the? Nice, uh, you know trying, I mean? to, trying to react, reenact that scene from uh, a scary movie? Hey, just grabbing some nuts. Yeah, just getting uh, some peanuts. Yeah, it's a bright day, Schweiss. Time to wake up. Um, <laughs> but uh. Yeah, so this guy, this guy ended up being like his one of his greatest rivals later yeah. on in life. But they were really because good friends. technically, so this brings in we should t- talk about the you know the black bones and the white bones. Yes, this is some very really vague interesting statement. cultural stuff uh, where yeah, the, if it's kind of uh, family based, so yeah. like they base their their hierarchy based off of like how how close to uh, an important person in within the, past the family. You were. Within that family, uh, yeah. yeah, within that family, and so like, um, if you you were a white bone, if you were like a direct descendant, based off of like the you know and who originally the, started that group, who originally yeah. started, yeah, and then if and you're so, just like cousins or related to him, you'd be black bone of that family, yeah. And so basically, what happened was Genghis was a cousin to his blood brother, um. Uh, His uh, uh, blood he, brother was like, white bone, and Genghis was black bone, and then as they was, grew older, it was distant. It was like cousins in the very distant very, kind of yeah. past, you yeah. know. It, it's it's. Uh, and so he was solidly black bone, and then when they started getting older, of course, his friend. He was white bone and started trying to exercise some authority over him. And that is when Genghis is like, hey, I don't like this. He's doing some stuff. Talk to his wife, Borda. I thought it was really interesting that you could become a white bone. If you were your own family. If you made your own family yeah. and then like had the ability to exercise your but strength over you the You were white boned within your own family, but if you went, but you would still be considered black bone to that other family even if you left you don't raise your status you raise your own status within your own gur within your own tribe but technically the other tribe is still higher up if you go to interact they with could, them they argued it though and that's why it was like really and so that's like when his, he he the, took their his animals blood brothers was a direct like family of the person he like actually of the this woman married this guy and so they were a direct descendant of that line right but then she also got like was she raped or something? And he descended from that line, or was it like a stepfather thing? I can't remember. It was, it was I like, don't know. It had something she to had, do with She had know. two different sons. It had something to do with first like wife down. and second wife as well. Yeah. Um, anyways, he didn't like his, his friend doing that, even though they've been they're such close friends. He's exercising authority over him. He, he doesn't stand for that. So he takes their animals and stuff and he leaves with his family. Uh, and then a bunch of other something. people follow him too because yeah. they because uh, they liked him more. They liked him yeah. because it became a challenge between the two of them. Whereas, yeah, he has one guy has more authority, but people tended to like you know uh, Tamuchin more, and so they left with him and their animals and stuff like that. And then he never they never chased him down. Yeah. Um. So he kind of started his own thing over here, and he was over there. Um. Then this period that he starts, you know you know, exercising more influence over the area. And when when it, when it comes to, like, who is that um, that one con that was kind of over that area? The His uh, bl- or his father or whatever? The And he would play both both of them against each other. I can't remember his name. Oh, it was An Khan. That's An what Khan. it was. Yeah. And so that's when An Khan, they, I don't know, there's a period of raids and stuff like that. I... Basically, they would basically, they both were working for him because he was like, kind of like the great con, essentially. Yeah, um, he was kind of like the so emperor. he was sending them off to like go do stuff, and then Genghis would like capture all these other bands and make them part of his own. 
Um, yeah. In, until like the th- and there both was only of them three were gr- remaining creating cons. influence for themselves too. Yeah. So there's only three remaining cons: him, his blood brother, and then his like spiritual father or whatever. Yeah, and he catches on pretty early that like this guy's been playing them all um, the whole time, like to kind of keep them all weak, to keep yeah. them in line, and. He doesn't really, he's not really a fan of that, but he just kind of puts it on the back burner, right? Because he's like, we'll deal with this at whenever we can. But he acknowledges the fact that they're being, they're intentionally being set up to have animosity amongst all the clans to fight amongst each other so they never have a centralized, you know, force to be able to take on these bigger areas like him, like the that overlord guy. And he starts he starts to realize that, and that's when he starts really gathering all of the tribes together. He's like, you know, right. we can do this. We don't need to be under this fucking guy. We can do it ourselves. Um, and that's where I, I that's where he's like, uh, it's it's crazy. You can see this again if you watch like Game of Thrones with what Danny does in Game of Thrones. It's like the same exact thing as what uh, Genghis does um, as far as like gathering everyone together, like performing these huge feats, you know, conquering cities, conquering the great leaders, killing the great leaders of the city, and then everyone in that city follows them and goes with them, you know? Yeah. You see it all all the time in that show, and it's it's this. She's that character. She's I mean, Genghis yeah. Khan. I mean, I had, you know, read this book kind of around during when we really started getting into Game of Thrones, and yeah, I definitely saw... All of the, you know, yeah, the similarities. At first you think it's Drogo, but then, because he looks like he would, but then you're like, no, he, it's he's actually not the her. One who unites, <laughs> he's not the one who, who who unites all of the, um, I can't, what do they call them again? They're like cows. Cows. She's not the one who unites them all. It's, it's, it's really her. Yeah, it's so, her. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you have that. They're gaining power against each other. Um, and then they're, what? Uh, nothing, nothing, nothing. Don't worry about it. They're 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 gaining power and they're they're amassing an army, um, and then the two you know blood brothers start to fight back and forth. And now you put some more, um, the, they bring up more about their shamans and stuff like that. And apparently, you know, the shamans started to really favor um, Tamachin um, more. And through that, a lot of you know his his blood brother was losing a lot of his followers. They were starting to go to Genghis and stuff like that. That and because of his tactics, were like always winning. Like, yeah, he never lost a fight. And they were like, well, we should probably join him because he's a lot stronger. Yeah, and it's just the way he went about attacking. He was just really good at. Yeah, his tactics were like taken from uh, like hunting. Uh, the the ideas that he had while hunting. Because uh, they were just skills that were transferred to, um, yeah, to tactics where he would like round people up and then attack them at once and, and stuff like that. Where he would like trap them, mm-hmm. just you know, vague things like that, which would always win because uh, they were all horsemen and he just really knew how to use that. Mm-hmm. And then there came uh, the the point where yeah, he basically won over his blood brother or his you know chosen brother. Um, and then um, he was going to, I guess, go back to his spirit father, the the great Khan. And he was, I guess, he was wanted someone to, to get married. A or, yeah, he was going to he was going to arrange a mar- like marriage. His yeah. son and his, and then his, and then on the way done. there, he figured uh, or he heard or found out that he, that the great Khan was planning on killing him. Yeah. yeah. So he turned around. Everyone like spread and ran. Um, and this was because the great Khan actually preferred the other guy. I think it was because he was afraid of uh, Temujin's like yeah. influence because he Cause saw he, that he he's was super a, influential. Yeah, and so he was definitely a bigger threat to his authority than um, the other guy. Yeah, so he found out about that because it was he was supposed to go as like an envoy and like it was just like a peaceful thing. He only had a few people with him, and then uh, yeah, they reunited and they all kind of came back together. And he fucking started gathering everybody, and he went to take him out. Yep. Um, and he took out everybody. I mean, he pushed into China pretty goddamn deep. And so I guess that was kind of the point where Genghis had more or less united a huge chunk of the clans underneath him. You know, underneath him. Yeah, he, he united and, all uh, of them, and he realized that he basically, his people needed a new enemy in order to, yeah, like, not and to go really back super to the, uh, the clan fighting. 
and he needed that for at least a couple generations otherwise they would like immediately like turn to that so he, yeah. he and he wanted to like enrich their lives so he like went out and just started attacking like other people like and China then any clan and, that would and, spite him though too um he would yeah if they didn't do what they said they would do he would go destroy them yeah. after he was done um but he was basically voted to be the Khan of the Mongol people, united them. And then here he also started to change the way things operated within the Mongol, um, you know, tribes. Yeah, he kind of had he, to because there were he so many people now. No longer put stock into his family. So that's the one thing uh, that he probably saw growing up. Just because, you know, it's your birthright doesn't mean you're good at it. And so he then started putting people in power um yeah who, he, he who could believed in use the system of like people who should be in power based on their merits Merit rather than their than blood their, their lineage uh, and so he actually kind of you know his own sons he kind of you know hey you do get some power but just very little i'm gonna have a trusted advisor be there with you at all times type of thing um and he really set up the framework for his army his generals to where people that were super fucking loyal to him and people he knew who who who, who could you know hold their own and really command people that's who he put in charge of his armies yeah and he yeah. formulated um his armies or his his units off of a base 10 system um that he they postulized that he could have probably pulled it from you know how the romans did things yeah yeah and so he really organized his people put competent people in charge and now it's time to fucking you know we're a raiding people we always raided each other but now let's go raid where we've seen some riches so they've always heard and seen some of the riches that would come up from china and so that's where they started yeah and they they were just tearing the chinese up i mean they they do this really cool thing that uh the the japanese kind of do a little bit with the bonsai except for the bonsai you don't retreat um, no, they, so it's this like is super fast. Sneak so this is this is things. the start of the Blitzkrieg type of thing. This is where the Germans got that tactics from, dude. It's where as they, they brought would, that up, where like he translated it to the lightning attack, or the something lightning like attack. That. Yeah, I was like, it's that's the the Germans stole super that. fucking. And then later no, on, then, he's no, like, they did. Yeah, yeah. They totally <laughs> he's like, right yeah, they totally stole that. And I was like, oh, cool. And, and then, it's funny because uh, they fought the Russians who were trying to suppress the. The history of the the cons and Germans were like, "Fuck you guys! We're gonna do th- we're gonna do their well, stuff." Well, yeah, they because didn't well, they could they could suppress later, it. Though. It's because you know, as we can you know, we'll find out later. It's all oral, almost. Uh, as right. we find out later, the Europeans are well acquainted with the Mongols. Yeah, all the way up yeah. into mid Europe. Um, well, no one said no they, one said dude, that Stalin was a genius. Fucked so. over the Mongol people in that in the history stuff. The yeah. fucking Europeans. are... <clears throat> Dicks. Yeah, yeah, that's revisionist history. I mean, um, yeah. but uh, so it's just the you appear real fast out of nowhere, super like fucking fast, and so like you hear about the Pony Express, or whatever, to send letters super fast. Like the Mongols did that too, but like with every person, they you know each Mongol warrior would have five horses that were his, and they would just rotate horses to keep yeah, a would, lightning they fast would set speed up. up. Like they would cross to, like, so much land so fast that you could have an army outside your city, like, and you wouldn't even know that they were coming. You wouldn't have any like idea that they were coming because they're coming so fast, and so boom they're there they're attacking and then they're gone yeah yeah and then they a lot of times what they would do is they would like leave stuff behind and then the people would like slowly come out to like gather all the shit and then they would just fuck them like they yeah would just, so if you so, and, like so many, they yeah, got into the cities tactics, yeah they got yeah. into the cities doing that and they won because of that one move it's like the yeah. fucking trojan horse baiting yeah. shit <laughs> yeah. just baiting them out of their stronghold come and on then, you little greedy shits then, so you want um, this gold pile and then we really get into this era of the Mongols really fucking conquering. They get all the way down to India, but then they stop because the humidity was making them sick and the diseases and their weaponry that's really well designed just didn't work as well in the humidity, their bows and stuff like that. Yeah, they were their it was range. also like the landscape didn't work very well with the horse hooves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Their, their bow range was really dependent on like where it came from because they... They know how to make bows in the dry, arid, like, steppe yeah. lands. And then they also make a point here when they first started getting into China. China is now turned into an agricultural um, type culture. Yeah. And the and then they, you know, only rich people could eat meat and stuff like that. And so the average Mongol living off of meat and, you know, milk, 
like they were much stronger and healthier because all the Chinese were eating at that point, or the you know the peasants that would try to defend were just eating grains, and they were malnourished and sick from that. And so, you know, a Mongol yeah, could go day like if it's like harsh times. Um, where you would have to like really space out how much you can eat. The Mongols could go a long time with a little bit amount of food yeah, because they were so much healthier and uh, to start off with, whereas the Chinese couldn't even do that. They couldn't, yeah. they couldn't match the, the endurance that the Mongols could. And they also mentioned in here that the Chinese peasantry, which is most of their army, yeah. mostly subsisted off of gruel essentially. So it wasn't even like rice. It was just like base grains yeah. mushed up. Yeah. With some fucking water, and yeah. so like it's there's almost no nutritional value in that, right? Yeah. That's the whole point. That actually makes you dumber. Like it, you can dumb down a people by doing so that. And that's one of the reasons. That's what, that's what happens when you become malnourished. Yeah, you you lose your your brain starts to get eaten basically, mm. and then and that's why that's how you control the peasantry, right? Yeah. But then the problem with that is that's your fucking army, and now they're they're weak and stupid, and they right. just get fucked, and they got fucked so hard, and then they started coming up against walled cities you're like oh these are you know steppe people you know a walled city what's go what are they gonna do um so mongols had several different tactics basically they would send an envoy into the city saying hey surrender to us we'll treat you well um and if you don't we'll kill most of you um and send your people in front of us for to the next city that we attack to be his fodder in which they did several times and if the city capitulated they were largely left to their own devices. They would leave some Mongols in charge and stuff like that. Yeah, they but would the like Mo- kill what's the they, leaders because they, they couldn't trust them. Yeah, once then, they conquered a city, like they really were very tolerant as yeah, compared they, to other rulers. They didn't. Uh, they didn't force their. One of the interesting things that uh, Genghis did too was he didn't treat the nobility with any like, any respect any respect at all he would have the he would have the nobility find out all their riches he's like i don't care about the riches we can see i want you to show me the riches which you've have hidden away type of thing um and he would then slaughter the aristocrats the rich people he didn't have need for them he's going to put his own yeah, people in charge. they didn't have any skills like at all that so was he, the biggest thing yeah they were just useless and yeah. he he saw it as them their uselessness made everyone else useless, and that's yeah. why they could conquer it, I think. Yeah, so he, yeah, again, another quote from later in the book is, he didn't see himself as a great warrior. He just thought everyone else was just worse. Yeah. Um, and that's why he was able to do what he could do. Um, a surefire way to get your city burned to the fucking ground was to, uh, A, kill the uh, envoy that he'd sent. That's a huge slight against them, and you will, you will all fucking perish if that happens. Or two, he conquered you, he put people in charge, and then you, you leave, and then you try to revolt against, kill his his uh, people, revolt. Then he's coming fucking back and burning your city to the <laughs> yeah. ground. Yeah, there was yeah, oh man, it. that one chapter where like somebody did that, and they just like turned around and then just fucking annihilated. Oh, the everyone. Mongols can't keep, can't control us. They're all gone. They're never coming back. Let's revolt. Oh hey, <laughs> and then they, they revolted, and then die. the whole it's just like the next morning you wake up. Oh man, I'm so glad the Mongols aren't here. You look out your window. It's just a fucking mass of horses just bearing down in your city. <laughs> yeah, uh, they you can destroyed. Get back Fast, yeah, that's like the whole they, thing. They got everywhere. The whole thing about quick. the Mongols was how fast they could move, and it was like you, know, you could hardly, you know, you know, had enough time to you know set up a resistance. And then when they would, you know, make the peasants flee before them, and all the refugees that they would send in front of them to really, you know, make it difficult food wise for the people taking in the refugees and stuff like that. The Mongols were right on the heels of the refugees. You didn't have any time at all to set up a resistance. Like, Oh, they're fucking coming. And then they're here. Um, and then that was just one of their big tactics tactics. Yeah. They killed a lot of people. They sent people that, you know, tried to resist. They would use those guys as fodder to fill up, you know, the trenches or the moats and stuff like that. And then when they came up to Walled City that tried to, tr- tried to turtle up, it was just like, now the Mongols, you know, when they capture city and they find people who are intelligent, read, write, engineer, and stuff like that, they would then send those guys back to the homeland to start working on stuff. Yeah, they'd give them yeah. positions and, and so just like not them do stuff. Only were the Mongols super fast, but they had the soup, you know, the smartest people making war machines for them. They would make uh, yeah, siege they engines. They didn't have like blacksmiths or they like would, anything of their own. So yeah, like they would they undercut found somebody yeah. with that kind of skill. They would immediately utilize it. Yeah, it's just it's not just you know Genghis Khan saw the value and what they could bring, and he 
immediately used it. Yeah, they, um, they had like a huge like fleet of engineers from China to just like fucking build them siege engines whenever they needed. You it know, it from makes stuff you, that's all around. It makes they you would wonder, undercut the walls and stuff. It makes you wonder how much better those people's lives were as Mongol captives so to speak like really? they talked about Good, that a yeah. little bit they were like it be, like especially <laughs> later on when you know his like, grandson started making schools for everyone yeah like, yeah like, it enriched everyone's lives and so especially when the like, cities he left alone like he, they capitulated or he conquered them like they were allowed to believe what they could believe they were basically you know all they would have had to do was send tribute to yeah, the con they just, they just pay like, taxes pay taxes yeah. it's like 10 percent is what it was yeah and so I guess, you know, it's, yes, he was a horrible conquering monster, but at the same time, he was building a fucking society behind him. Yeah, that, that, you he have to do. He was ruthless, but at the same time, like, he, he was also weirdly kind. Like, even when he was, like, looting a place, he would tell all the people yeah, that's to another leave the huge, town first. that's another huge change. Uh, it, so like no one would get hurt while they were looting the pl- while they were looting. Yeah, the he city. would round everyone up, send them out, and then he would oversee the loot. It wasn't about the soldiers running in, about just looting and everything. Then he they would could. share with like literally everyone. So they break it down to they loot the city, you know, completely loot it. Yeah, ten um, percent goes to the Khan and his family, and then the next percent goes to the widows of you know of the Mongols. Yeah, and then then and then they keep going down and distributing. I thought that was the really interesting that yeah. he like gave money to like the the widows and orphans. Yeah, well, that's, that's because they don't have someone. Yeah, I know, but care that's, of them. That's, like, that was really interesting. Yeah, that's that, like, modern. He dedicated like some of that that money that was the income to them specifically. Yeah, that's a super modern idea of like welfare for the people who died in the war that you fought, you know? Yeah. It's something like that. Like taking care of your your wounded warriors or your dead warriors and their families. <clears throat> and then everyone else would get a piece, right? Right. You'd get a piece representative of their... And so there was this huge influx of wealth into the Mongol Empire. Genghis Khan only went so far... And then he stopped trying to conquer China. He went all the way down to to just about where India was, kind of around that area. But he never did more in that area. And he pulled his people back. They all went back to Mongolia. Um, super wealthy now. Everyone's wearing silks, whereas before they were wearing, you know, you know, basically rags and skins and stuff like that. Yeah. yeah. And then they were just fucking spending money and using their newfound wealth at a huge rate. And they did crazy stuff too. Like they, they, they basically did tax exemptions for the poor and for, uh, religions. You remember that? Yeah. And so that was, and he also did that for <clears throat> anyone who had a, a major function, like the, the craftsmen, like if they, yeah. had, if they had an important job, then they wouldn't be taxed. Yeah. So it's like, it's really, it's really cool. Um, what he did with that. And then also the religion thing, it reminds me of Craig and his <laughs> Civ five religion where he'd send, <laughs> he'd send guys into my town to like create unrest. And a lot of times I, because of that, like the religious, more religious towns, they were kind of okay with him taking over. Like, because they're like, well, now we're not, we're not being oppressed by the government here that tells us we can't practice yeah. our religion freely. Because to him, it all didn't, and none of it mattered. It was all like, you guys can do what you want. Just, and he, and he set up laws about like, you can't fight uh, amongst each other. You can't steal. There's anti theft laws. Yeah. There's- he actually set up. Yeah, he yeah, a whole bunch of new laws. Like uh, he set up a law against even adultery, but it was more like what happens in your tent or your gur stays in your gur. Like no one, like you can do what the fuck you want to yeah, do. The, the but as soon as it starts affecting it. people on a larger scale, yeah, then, you're... then then it's against the law. So I don't know like how they meant it, but he's like, hey, that, keep and it that's to yourself. Also kind of why he introduced that like the group punishment thing because like if he if someone was gonna take it higher then like the family would stop them. Right. Which it's, is a really interesting idea. It is an interesting idea and the way they did it is kind of cool because it's like it, it kind of own... works for them specifically because they didn't have the idea for policing anything. It's oddly it's and a... they let everyone kind of deal with their own shit. Yeah. So like if like so he didn't have to deal with like the everyday things of like oh somebody stole from like this other family, well they could just take care of it themselves. Yeah, it's almost like a it's almost like a weirdly libertarian idea. Like no one's, you take care of your own stuff, but no one else is going to do anything until it like gets out of your, right. Out yeah. Of your thing. So when it's no longer just affecting you, then we're going to shut it down. But like up until right. that point, it's your responsibility to deal with it. It's weird. Um, he had like a, his political system was like oddly all over the place, but really progressive, honestly, for what, for the time, like right. oddly enough coming from, 
and especially uh, since like every other place was either ruled by a church or l- ruled by a king right. that was completely untouchable whereas he made himself susceptible to his own really laws. oppressive rules yeah yeah and then yeah he was again yeah contained in it with Which his own laws yeah probably the first case in history of like a ruler making themselves like being able to be taken down by his own laws yeah because like every well other he, person he was basically he basically set up rules and laws to where he basically outlawed the way he came into power yeah yeah which is interesting but like yeah. he saw that it was you know it was against their culture and it was against um a lot of things but. and then um as far as religion would uh went um a lot of the mongols actually saw christianity and you know converted to christianity just because you know jesus conquered death and to them that was such a powerful symbol that they converted christianity but to them it was really more you know the god you know the great big big blue sky that he, identified yeah, them as he, like, christians christianity where they would take kind of like christianity the elements of it but it never their, really became like they were now yeah they had their own kind of christians religion, and but it was loose Pope. enough that but, yeah. like they could overlap easily they were mongols first and then you know yeah. however else they wanted to they, identify. they never believed themselves to be anything other than mongols right yeah yeah and that's a really good way to approach it because then you don't become super dogmatic although yeah. you could argue that there's a dogmatism to being a mongol but oh yeah, well, yeah. Not, not i mean the for the most level. part it's like you, you look at this conquering you know individual this ruthless person he created such a super to- tolerant and almost you know we're starting to get into you know the how advanced his society was for the time um yeah but they basically invented guns like they had sort of they kind of took the idea that so this is again another great example of how they would take knowledge from all these places they were conquering yeah. and have it work together um and then they would make you know those fire dragons they would also make smoke bombs and you know foul smells with it but then yeah they would shoot rockets and basically I fireworks that was really interesting that they used the the disgusting smelling stuff against people because yeah. there was like that that idea that foul smelling stuff caused disease yeah so they would just use that against them because they didn't believe that shit yeah it's it's funny it's like since they were so tolerant and they really didn't give much into the mean of course they had their own superstitions especially yeah, surrounding they, they death did. but then they wouldn't let the superstitions you know that plagued others didn't really affect them but uh then we kind of get to this point where he's like, hey, you know, if we're not conquering, we're, we're going to lose this wealth and what we've become accustomed yeah, to. Yeah, because his nation became so expensive to run because yeah. there's so many people to feed. Um, and then they also created the post office. Like, that was pretty fucking crazy. They just, like, stations to deliver letters. And yeah, deliver like messages. I said, the Pony like, Express. That's, uh, yeah, like... Genghis Khan did it first in, in the 1200s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ben Franklin's just a fucking hack. <laughs> <laughs> So he created all, all of his ideas were Genghis's. But, but yeah. remember, even he though created, they had all of this wealth and had all of this even going took on, took a kite and stuck a key on the, it. And yeah, discover lightning. the majority of the of the Mongol people, and he had zip codes too. even though they had all of this wealth, were still basically they would still only live in their gurs, their tents and stuff, and they would still move with the herds. Then you know yeah, they, they would were, still move around. They were still nomadic. They wouldn't still have. They wouldn't have like a huge major hub. Um, at this point, that comes later with um, his his children. Yeah, his but descendants. now he needs to start a war again to help the influx of yeah, stuff. And, he went and so to, went to the he Middle East. To attack, like the Islamic countries, yeah. which were really wealthy. Yeah, and they also had a lot of science going on down there. A yeah. lot of like technology. Huge going. amounts of wealth, huge amounts of knowledge. And the guy in the book said, you know, it was probably, you know, we would see a very different Middle East today if, uh, you know, Genghis Khan did not go in and conquer them, basically. Um, just because of how much wealth and how much knowledge they had. Um, he basically, yeah, he went in there and, and, and brought them all back. He disrupted that, you know, the Middle East in that part. So... Yeah, and he was he was fucking those guys up pretty hard too. Like he wasn't really having problems until he got super far down, and then the desert started being a little too. Then much. he got he yeah he went to you know basically the sea of sand. Yeah, um, he kind of stopped there. There's no point in going forward, and they kind of and some of the Mongols when they were doing the camp in the Middle East and stuff like that, they kind of pushed more into the Russian area and kind of glimpsed uh, Western Europe, uh, but huge they influx of really wealth, but never there. went further than that. Huge influx of wealth again. Genghis Khan is now starting to get older, um, and he now realized he didn't s- spend enough time with his boys. Yeah, and now it's yeah. time to carve up his empire. 
Yeah, that was a really interesting part where like his sons, uh, where there was like a debate whether or not his oldest was actually his son because of the time where his wife got kidnapped. Because yeah, he his wife was kidnapped and uh, she was pregnant shortly thereafter. Yeah, that was something after. that I was like confused about for a sec because like it made it seem that he w- that she was only kidnapped for a couple days. I mean, but yeah, it was actually way longer than that. Yeah, yeah she was gone for a long time. It was like a couple months. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I mean, after that, he, he, he sits down with his sons and he realizes that, like, this is not probably not going to work out unless he can work this out in his last few years. Because um, he sees that there's such yeah. division amongst them. And it's partly his own fault. No, it is. It, it's it definitely goes, it, it says it's his fault. It's yeah. because of the idea that he only gave it to those who deserved it, but his kids feel but like But he would never, like, it. spend with his time with his sons and he kept trying to, like... You know, explain to them the knowledge he had gathered and just the, you know, all of that that he, that he, you know, found out that he had to work for. He was trying to, as best as he could, explain it to him. Yeah. Uh, he but he would send a couple of his sons on campaigns together. So they would have to fight together. But they'd always conflict. Yeah. They're, they're, they're yeah and they, conflict. they grew up in, under the wealth that he had, like, uh, obtained. <coughs> that, as well. This whole and part so they made didn't me realize. keep thinking about, you know, hard times make. Uh, Hard times make, uh, what was it, powerful people or strong it, people? Strong people make good times. Good times make weak people. Weak people make hard times. Yeah, yeah, and that's exactly, uh, that's not exactly what happened after, but it was definitely a decline. There was right. some good stuff that Ogadai and, and then his other brother did. And but. so there was this one campaign he sent two of his sons on that they were going to go conquer the city that was going to be in the eldest son's domain after his father yeah, it passed. Was like in the <clears throat> Russia area, wasn't it? And so, yeah, and so they started having this argument over <clears throat> of how to conquer it because the, the younger son's like, hey, you're going easy on the city yeah. just because you don't want it destroyed because it's going to be yours. We're going to lose Mongols over it. Um, and then they go in the city. It became this huge, well, they were difficult also thing. fighting because, like the, who, they were trying to impress everyone else right. with their with their skills in order to become the next great con. Yeah, and it's funny because the other the other brother was like, "You want to you want to destroy everything," or you, one of them was like, "You want to destroy, destroy everything, everything so, I have because, so I have nothing," and then you don't want to do anything so that you have everything. And <laughs> like, so they tried it um, because of this, you know, disconnect. They had to start fighting house to house, and Mongols weren't good at weren't good at that. Yeah. And they started trying to burn down the city, um, and then that still didn't work because these were like relentless. You know, you know, these people were resisting them so well, and so they're like, "Okay, well, fuck it, we're gonna go do go do some engineering work over here." They built a dam, diverted the river, and flooded the whole fucking city, and it was basically wiped out. It was never built. Yeah, they here. basically yeah. just razed the town, and they were yeah. just like, "Fuck it, fine." You're I right. I mean, yeah, we'll they were losing too many all. people. Yeah, <laughs> um, and so. When Genghis heard of it, he was so mad, like so mad. And he's like, do you think that, you know, people follow you because of the things you've done? Do you think these people are scared of you? Blah, blah, blah. Just huge tirade um, and against his son. Um, and then, yeah, I don't, you know, kind of what came of that. His sons were still infighting. Yeah, they almost fought each other. They almost turned their yeah uh, armies against each other in that area as well because of that shit. Um, and then, of course, eventually he he one of his one of the interesting things that I remember from the um, I, did I ever have you read that uh, Emperor series, the Julius Caesar? Yeah, I read it. Yeah, there's that guy did one on Genghis <clears throat> Khan, too. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. Uh, and he had this like, oh, man, it's so fucking cool. In this book, it was so much cooler. But uh, <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> it's, 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 it's it is historical fiction. So you can make it as awesome as you want. But, uh, you know, you remember that shaman that he had, that super high-ranking shaman that eventually started trying to take power for himself? Yeah. Um, that was later, but yeah. It was not this, it's not much later than this. No, was, I don't think it's... It was in one of the reigns of his, like, sons. No, it was like, him. Grandsons. No, it was, it, was him. it was definitely Genghis, because this is what made people, um, this conquering of the shaman made people think of Genghis Khan as the most powerful shaman as well. Yeah. Oh, you're right, because he was bullying his brother. That, yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. And then he was he was trying to take over his own little slice, because he was right. untouchable because of Genghis. Um, but in the book, he uh, fucking he breaks his back over over his knee, and he yeah, leaves the say, fucking feed to the feed. Well, the birds. they they basically have <laughs> like, this wrestling thing, and Genghis Khan is like, 
go wrestle outside type of thing. And then he, they, they take him outside before the guy can say, like, hey, I don't want to do this. And they take him outside and people wait and they just <laughs> yeah, break his fucking like back. Three guys. <laughs> they say, they like say, beat yeah, the shit out they of beat him. the shit out of him, break his back and build a tent over him so he can die. <laughs> yeah. So they didn't have to watch him die. Yeah, that was really fucking cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so even the, the account in here is still pretty awesome. It's like, it's so random though because it's like, all right, now cover it up. Well, Let him die in the tent. Because dying is like taboo and they didn't want to have to see that. Yeah, so yeah. Just like, give him a tent to die. And it was this that made people think, well, if he could do this to the shaman, he must be a very powerful shaman in his own right. Yeah, so he was basically a god almost in their yeah, eyes. They, they yeah. viewed him as like not only their actual leader, but as like a spiritual leader as well. Yeah, exactly. And that gave him super, like, supreme loyalty after doing that. Uh, and there was really no one else to, you know, no one else trying power moves on him either. Right. So. Um, and it's weird because that guy was try- almost doing the same thing that their their like great con overlord guy was trying to do for a while, just kind of like pit them against each other and then pick up the scraps when they're done. Right. And so this kind of that's a good series though. It's uh, right. the Genghis series. That's uh, that's a really fun one. I mean, maybe I'll read it at some point. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but then yeah, Genghis Khan is finally in his decline, um, where he then decides he wants to go out a conquering again. Um, but then he gets wounded, basically, and doesn't he fall off his horse? No, yeah, it's really unclear exactly what got him, but oh, a lot of people think it was like he took an arrow to the knee. Yeah, which is pretty funny. <laughs> uh, which like caused some disease or something because they couldn't clean it, and so he uh, he died yeah. because of that. Yeah, and then it's up to now, um, you know, his sons, you know, still some of them, you know, they have basically a voting and they need to get one of the sons in power and it was the well-liked but drunkard son yeah, that the first takes over and Ogain he just spends so much die. fucking money um he was the one who was the first one to actually start to build a center power right yeah he built the city um to base in which they still didn't really use it, it was just as a city. one it was basically giant like building, a glorified storehouse storehouse that he that was the um, seat of power but then you know that was the like the one real city building they would use it like every every few months until like around winter and the people time they, they conquered the people who they conquered the would work out of there and stuff like that uses a giant storehouse yeah and they were starting to lose wealth because it was so far out there and they had to, you know, um, import all the stuff. They were getting less and less from their, uh, you know, tributes and stuff like that. Yeah, so um, he had to go out conquering again. Oh boy, time to go conquering again. <laughs> Here I go conquering again. Um, they spent a lot. Was it him who also built that giant wine tree, that giant alcohol tree? Uh, yeah, it was, it was Obadiah. Yeah, yeah, like right when he, before he died, he built that. He yeah. had uh, this fucking awesome tree that I wish it still existed because I want to see that shit. Um, but this they golden had, like, alcohol some, tree, yeah. They had some, like, I, I think it was, like, some Chinese and uh, some Middle Eastern guys build this for him. Yeah. And it was uh, a silver tree that had, like, gold snakes and a, and a silver angel, like, on top of it. Um, and they would, like... They just had to like press butt, or no, they had to like Pull. blow into it and yeah. like make alcohol flow out of these. It like, would be like spots. different kinds of alcohols too. It wasn't just yeah, all it was one like type. Four kinds. It was like yeah. the from each location that they had conquered. Yeah, it was like uh, rice wine, wine from grapes, and then like their traditional uh, mare's milk thing that was fermented. Yeah, which I can't remember the name of, uh, and then. Oh, what was it? I don't know. Oh, it was ale or mead or something like that. But anyways, um, he tried to send people out of conquering again. Or he, um, so did he? He's the one who called all the generals back together and go, "Hey, what should we do? We need to go conquering again." And they tried to say, "Oh, let's go down, man. You know, finish off where you know, finish up China." Yeah, there was a bunch of people that wanted to go back into China. Uh, and um, take but over then, the rest of it because like there was a lot left of China that they hadn't taken over, and right. then there's some other ones that wanted to move more into the Islamic countries again. And then there was one of the um, generals who had glimpsed Europe as like, hey, you know, let's check out this European land. Yeah, that was a uh, super day, I think. Super day, and yeah, so yeah, they decided they decided to okay, let's check out these new lands. Then my favorite part 
is when it like describes Super Day as getting super fat, like so yeah. fat that they he had, had to like they had, they had to drive him around in an, uh, an iron, iron chariot. chariot. Yeah, yeah. Ah, uh, that made me laugh. I just had this sudden vision of like a seven hundred pound Mongol man, like because he couldn't fit. In, well, like, another a thing about these crate. these Mongol ponies is that they were smaller than other horses, but they were super fast, and so they probably wouldn't, you know, a larger they European. Had some would, work yeah. horses, and, and other but that's the ne- like next that. point that we see when they start moving into Europe, and then all these competing Russian Tsars and stuff like that. Yeah, and they're starting to get into the Eastern Europe area. And these Russians who are always, you know, squabbling amongst themselves um, now see wind of these new heathens coming out of the east. Oh, man. What was the name? There's those three, like, czar dudes that had the exact same name. Well, they all named them the same thing. That was, like, the title that they were trying to Was all, that their yeah. title? I thought that was, like, their actual name. They, they were all named the same. Yeah. Because they all wanted to be that that thing, they were kind of fighting against each other. But then, once the Mongols start riding in, they decided they wanted to you know work put together. A, work together. And then they got fucked. So I don't know, like, you know, I don't know how tactics worked back then. But basically, they sent this uh, Mongol force out. You know, all these knights and stuff. These you know Russian Tsars come out on their fucking huge horses and all their armor and stuff. Had their peasant warriors all lined up, ready to go. Basically, um, they rode all the way up to the line outside of, you know, the range of, you know, the peasants. They couldn't fight them back and just started, like, sitting there on their horses, shooting arrows at them. Yeah, just relentlessly. <laughs> just sitting there. Uh, and then, like, all the peasants are starting to die. Oh, they started panicking. Then their, their own they tried to run away, but their horses back, yeah. were too, like... No, that was they, the that's, the first. They the archers started shooting, shooting back, back, but they couldn't and reach. Then, but then, but then they, you know they started you know shooting at the Mongols, and the Mongols feigned a retreat. Yeah, and yeah. And then they're like, "Oh, we got them to break." Yes, and so they start charging after them, these knights and stuff, and it, they were like big heavy knights on these horses, and the that were you know they're laboring underneath all that they weren't as agile as the mongol horses and so they led them in a retreat as far as until you know their horses started tiring out and they started lagging behind and then they turned back around and started uh, killing them yeah and then the funny thing was is later they like near the end of that they actually started using those guys as arrows to like pick off the last bit of them as they were trying to get back yeah. to their houses because like their 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 arrows they couldn't use. Uh, maybe this was another battle. I think that was another. That was the next. Was. That was another battle. But later. they they just. I'm yeah. interested by that one too because like I kind of want to know what they did to the arrows. I think it was that they couldn't to do fit in their notch. bows. Yeah. So what I think it was, I was thinking about it, um, is maybe the horse bows that they were using had a smaller string or smaller sinew, so they could make their notches a little bit smaller. And then they wouldn't be able to string it onto a, a, a bow with a larger uh, drawstring in diameter. Yeah, either yeah, that or like it had to be something like that. Yeah. Or the way they notch the like something like on the sides, maybe it lined up with their bow. I don't know. I I'll have to look into it. The thing that makes most sense to me is that their arrow notches were much smaller, and they couldn't fit it on their yeah, bows. That, that would be the only thing because if it was bigger, then they definitely could have used it. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, just thinking about it, that's the only thing that made made make sense to me where they couldn't actually fit it on the bowstring, and but then their arrows with larger notches could easily fit on a shorter or on a, on a smaller bowstring. So yeah, um, and so they kill these Russian princes basically, and now Europe is starting to hear about it. Um, they're sending you know the, these refugees, just the same old war tactics of sending the refugees in front of them and falling shortly behind them. Um, and this is also where I can't, I can't remember how far away it was, but where they built a wall around a walled city. Oh yeah. That was in the, uh, I think it was like the, it was either Russia or some of the Islamic countries. No, I thought it was further into Europe, like into Poland. Uh, I don't think maybe it was because they started conquering Poland and stuff like that. Maybe it was in Europe. Yeah. But they like, yeah, they, no, it was in the German the the, Ger- the German countries, I think. Okay, so that's a little bit further. So yeah, it, they push into now Eastern Europe and run through Eastern Europe just so super easy and stuff. Um, get to Poland, and that's when the Catholic churches really start like, oh, look, these heathens, what are they doing? And now, of course, Christianity propaganda, it's like, oh, well, they're probably angry because yeah, these all, are the lost like Jewish tribes. Like historians who it's are like, like, oh, oh this must be the lost Jewish tribe, and they are angry because we took the remains out of the, the whole 
holy land and they're here to claim it. And it's uh, the Jews are working with these Jews. Uh, we must slay Dude, the Jews part, in our own I cities. That was really odd because, like, it, it they they made the Jews start wearing symbols that they were yeah. Jews so they could, like, fucking kill them whenever they wanted. Yeah, it's like, no, the Jews like, are oh. giving them support. We can't let them rally around this lost tribe. We must slay them. Hitler stole more from history than I thought. <laughs> yeah. Or it's just, it's a long time of Christianity really hating on, on Judaism oh, Jude, because I, th- of it. You know, that's something I found out from a lot of different books recently is like, everyone hates the Jews for like no reason. No, they hate them because they're successful, I think. Like no, they, I, dude, generally, it's like that's... everyone for a long ass well, time. Well, if, like, if, if, if you, you the, read it, the it, Nikola Tesla book that in, I read, it was the, like it started like even in well, the like, Bible, the New Testament, and stuff, and everybody hate. There was like so much anti-Semitism, like it, well, during, it's, even it's, during that time, it's the whole thing where like, they're like, well, now it's uh, it's we're gonna you know make the life terrible for the Jews because they killed Christ and that's the whole idea of yeah, Christianity I, I know at the that time. Was like, and then um, it still doesn't make a whole It's lot ridiculous because it's not even that important in the Bible that it was the Jews, but everyone takes well, that. Well see Christianity it's oh it's always like it's ruling people through fear. And they always have to have a new target for people to fear for people to band against. Whereas the Mongols banded against, you know, everyone else and f- killed everyone else. It was like now Christians need to band against the Jews and it's it's not proper. It's see another thing that happened, it's it was not proper for a Christian man to be in the money business, to handle money and stuff like that. So the Jews you know, had this huge opening where they could be in charge of the banks and stuff like that and handle money. And then that's how they became super wealthy, super fast. And that's what Hitler blamed on them, stealing our wealth, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if it's Christianity's fault. I think it's people taking pieces of it and running wild with it. Yeah. More than anything, which you can do with like anything. I mean, if you look at like the Old Testament, uh, I know there's more stuff in the New Testament, I think, but the only thing in the Old Testament that talks about like in Sodom and Gomorrah it doesn't it doesn't even necessarily say that the guys are gay and that's why they killed him like it just says that they're going to rape everybody right that's like what the dude says he's like i'm going to rape you and i'm going to rape the women and it's like i don't know if that's really that's really gay you know like it's kind of gay cuz he's going to rape you but it's more like i have no there's no limit to my like destruction on any of you people than anything but like it for years and years and years forever it's been like oh that that's you know it's Sodom and Gomorrah whenever like gay rights get passed and stuff and I'm like it's the same kind of thing it's like "Eh, I think you're reading a little more into it than than you should and it's not like you're the only person that's done that but these people did that all the time and they they did blame the Jews all the fucking time in these villages and so the Jews that's so funny that they thought the fucking Mongolians were like ancient Jews (laughs) coming back for yeah, revenge. they thought that the Jews were, like, using <laughs> yeah. them, like, as their, And they thought as that their, like, they were buying up weapons. all weapons and stuff to give them support and everything like that. And so they started slaughtering the Jews. The Mongols, by the way, had no idea this was going on. So a whole bunch of Jews died and nothing had came from it. Yeah. But, uh... <clears throat> But uh, they st- then started pushing. They pushed through Poland and stuff like that. And then, like you said, they got into Germany. And then, you know, this big old great walled city, that they just built a huge wall around. And so they used this wall to hide what they were doing. They would start, you know, lobbing, you know, catapults. In, 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 in it was rocks a bunch of and, fear tactics. And they would like, lob. The, uh, <clears throat> they felt safe in their own walls. Yeah. But when they built a wall around them, then it was like, oh, shit. Now we're they can't leave. In our walls. Yeah, they can't. They can't leave. No food can get in. We can't get out. They're throwing stinky shit at us um, and destroying our walls. And they basically did that until the walls were broken down enough that they could then hop into the city. Yeah, then they took their own walls down and then just destroyed and then, everybody. And then one of the cities... Um, they didn't know that some of the Mongols were Christian and stuff like that. But one of the cities, they were like parading, you know, these relics of the saints around in front of the Mongols, you know, to the power of Christ will get you to flee from here. And basically they're just waving bones at the Mongols, which is something you don't do. <laughs> yeah. They were like, <laughs> um, what? Yeah. They, they thought they were like, they're trying to like, you know, make us dirty. They're, they're like showing us symbols of death. What? A, and so yeah, that, that city was burned to the ground. They fucked him up. I thought yeah. it was really interesting that like the the con started having a theological debate with the Pope at one point too. 
Because like they didn't believe that they were Christian, but they were like, yeah, we just have different ideas of well, what that means. Well, again, so this happens. I can't remember when that son died. I, th- I think he died during around the time of this, right? And then yeah. when he died, that's what made the Mongols then retreat. I mean, they got really far into you know the the middle of Europe. When Oga um, died, died, but then but then they couldn't go any further because it wasn't good land for their horses because. Um, the horses need lots of open well, grazing land. Yeah. There was a lot. Now it's starting to get foresty, and the you know the good you know open areas are all being farmed and stuff. It's not good for horses. And uh, so I think did didn't Oga die, die around this time? Yeah, when they were deep, yeah, deep into territory, and that's also another reason why they all left because they they See, go Ogedai back. Died. They need to go get a new ruler, and also it wasn't profitable anymore to keep pushing. Because the <laughs> one thing they found about the Russians and like up there, those people were really poor compared to like the yeah, Middle as East they were pushing into Europe as they were pushing into you know even into Germany and stuff like that they were not getting anywhere near as much wealth yeah as they were like with the the Middle Eastern guys right. and then one part of it though that they did explain is um, as they were conquering you know into Russia in uh, Eastern Europe and stuff they did meet some Italians and started selling some of these peasants off and Russians off as slaves yeah yeah that's another thing that's very similar to uh, to Danny in in the Game of Thrones books she all the slaves in Slaver's Bay, they're like all sorts of different people. And so it kind of brings kind of what they did back then because everyone was well, enslaved. That Danny was trying to free the slaves, whereas no, I know. Genghis Those... Khan saw these peasants as cattle. And, he, oh, yeah, you want to buy them? Sure. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's like a... But it, this wasn't Genghis. This was Ogaday. But it's just exactly. a Mongol idea. Yeah, it, it is. It still kind of ties into that. But then later they come to find out that that's going to sort of bite them the ass later from selling all these uh, Russians as slaves. Yeah. Um, but uh, start selling later. off these Russians as slaves. Um, and then they come back into, um, uh, you know, to pick a new con, basically. Yeah. Uh, one of the interesting things before we get on past his death, he, Ogadai made a city, uh, which is the first time this has ever happened. Well, uh, we were talking about the, the s- giant storehouse city that he made. Yeah. Karakorum. Yeah. Um, so that was the first time they'd done anything like that, which really that, that kind of made them a, a, a nation more than before. Cause before they were kind of like a roaming nomadic. Nation. Well, that's part that that's kind of what they said is started the decline of that time too, because normally they could move around with the herds and yeah, grasslands and yeah. stuff like that. But if they were all in one place, they couldn't leave it during the winter time to a better place. Yeah. The thing is, is they're nomads. And it costs a ton of money to ship stuff to it. Yeah. Um, even with their excellent roots that they had. Um, yeah, I thought it was really interesting that they built one specific place to house everything. Because, like, when Genghis did it, he, like, allowed some buildings. But it was only to, like, it was a f- just a few random ones to, like, store stuff. Uh, but then they made, like, one specific one to have everything go to, to be, like, their center. Yeah. And they wanted it to be, like, on a sacred place, essentially. Yeah, so Obadi- Ogadai had someone he wanted to make, you know, the the ruler after him, and then I don't think they didn't go with that guy, and so like there's a lot of turmoil, and that's one of the big reasons why they all came back after he died. Yeah, because it was like we need to get back, we need to get our hats in the ring, like we need to find who we're gonna who we're gonna have as our new leader, and a lot of people had a lot of their own ideas as to who that should be that are contrary to what the previous leader did, because it wasn't really about what the previous leader wanted necessarily it's weird it's like it is and it isn't you know like they can claim who they would like to have um and with ogadai it worked but i don't know if it's really law with them that you know i my heir must it just be has heir. to be like voted on that that person be right um, the con but uh with this switch though it's a great moment for a uh, intermission to try craig's next bounty oh yeah Yep, the cork sound. It's all important. There we go. That's a good one. I know. It's a super good one. All right. So this is the 10-year Ardbeg, the, kind of their baseline. It's a lot, uh, this one's a lot clearer than I remember yours being. Yeah, well, mine had some, I think, sherry in it too, which might have darkened it. <sighs> this is going to taste like fucking burning sea isn't it <laughs> it's gonna taste like burning anus i had a much more uh, gonna be like liquid smoke. i had a much more uh descriptive slash 
graphic description of what this is going to taste like. Oh yeah, what is it? Uh, there you go. It's not for the radio. What the uh, the Smokey the Bear thing? Yeah. Oh. What about like Smokey and his fucking Smokey cunt? Well, is that for the air? <laughs> that's that's basically <laughs> the <laughs> gist of what I said. Yeah. Ugh. All right, so uh, the one thing you'll notice about the Ardbeg tenure, it's fucking smoky, and that's probably the only thing you'll notice. Yeah, I can smell it like... Because the Yugodol that I had, which is starts with the tin years of base, but they cut it with something else, it is fucking smoky. This is just smoke. This is just the smoke? Should yeah, and I, I guess if you it drink it, it, I guess if you keep drinking it, you can then notice more than the smoke, but it's been a while since I've had this, so let's see if I can... I just saw you fucking like notice anything else. So he just smelled it. Shot of it. No, I smelled it. He's to the point where all he gets off of smelling alcohol is alcohol. Yeah, it's. I don't like. I don't like hard liquor. Remember what I told you. It's the way you drink it changes your experience. You don't slam it. Let it sit for a while. That's why I like beer more. Because you you don't slam beer either, but you drink it in like decent swaths. As you Whiskey drink. is a sipping drink. It's not about getting drunk. It's about But tasting. we're all going to do shots of it. Okay, you, it's because you poured out a shot's worth of it doesn't make it a shot. So you're going to slowly nurse it? Yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. Okay, let's slowly nurse it. Craig is like about to fucking douse Smell it. Smell it first and then take some in your mouth. Sounds really gay. I don't know why they'd smell your dick first. That is just as smoky as I remember. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Woo. But I like it. It wouldn't be my go-to. I like it, but I think the uh, Ugadol what we had last time is a little bit better. Yeah, I like the Ugadol a little bit more. It's but more I expensive. Do- I do enjoy this, but it's smoky as fuck. So that means well, that next smoke week is what I what I wanted it for. <laughs> next week I need to bring. Uh, I need to get some Logvolen. Oh yeah, Ron Swanson's drink of choice. Oh yeah, have you even watched that show? No. Yeah, I was gonna say I haven't either. It's an no. alright show. Um, but yeah, yeah, uh, that's a. It's a. Uh, it's a fucking. It's a uh, it's a true gentleman's book club with liquor. Yeah. Next thing we need is uh, some French maids and cigars. Yeah, a true gentleman's book club. Or the, this can be the start of a. Uh, yeah, just make sure that you uh, hold up a pinky while you're <laughs> sipping some of this. Yeah, Whew. that is smoke. To. Uh, that is just yeah. Smoke. Nothing. Nothing says class than drinking expensive whiskey out of shot glasses and fucking. I don't even know what this is. This is a beer glass, probably. It was uh no, it was whiskey. Whiskey. It was a lot. Yeah, it was a good whiskey too. Do you remember what it was? It was uh they called it spaghetti western. Okay. Mm. How did it compare to uh, what we've had so far? It was a mixed drink, so Ooh. okay. It was really well, good. Mixed drinks but... are always going to be fucking <laughs> good. And yeah, yeah, this is a mixed drink glass. Yeah, this uh, this goes this goes through your whole body. Yeah, yeah. So before we get through with Ogadai, he died. Uh, as, as far as you know, everyone dies, but he, he he wasn't he the one that created all the education and stuff like that. So like he was really no. La- um, it was mm. it was the one after. Do you mind if I? Uh, Pour a little more in my glass. No, it's, it's, no, oh, it's I Craig's. Was, I was gonna say it's yours. I was like, oh wait, no, it's not. Mind if I pour a little more in my glass? Was it Guyuk Gu- Gu- or whatever? Guyuk. No. <sighs> oh no, he only did it for two Which years. Which one was the first like dude that re- went in? W- w- just look for the dude who went into China. I can't remember his name. I think it might be. No, it wasn't Monk. Oh, I think it was the dude after Monk. Oh, it's Kublai. Yeah, Kublai. 
Yeah, Kublai Khan. Okay, so Kublai, Kublai is a badass. Yeah, Kublai right. is my favorite of the cons. Right, and so this this is the part where yeah, yeah. we had we had uh, he is we it's, had it's Genghis. all about Genghis. Genghis man. is great. Genghis but is yeah. Kublai. Kublai is really the one who is where made shit. the modern world. Yeah, yeah. Kublai, that's true. Yeah. Genghis <laughs> Khan set set the, the foundation set the for it. He set the political environment for it, and because of him, this happened. Then we had the little intermediate session of the you know the, the modern not really knowing what to do, how to do it. Fighting but people, then, losing, dying. Then Kublai Khan, this is where the Mongols are fucking, fucking, yeah. I this have a lot there. of respect for Kublai Khan, let's just say that, because, like, you know, the, I've read, uh, have, have you either, either of you guys read Machiavelli's Prince? No. No. So basically what that covers is, like, kind of, like, it talks about ruling countries, whether you take it over uh, or, like, various other things and one of the things that it talks about is exactly what this motherfucking dude did <laughs> when uh he took over china is like making himself appear more chinese right um which is something that you do when you take over a country because it's like they it makes them more accepting uh, of you yeah it makes them more accepting of you makes them more yeah, docile like, he, because if you appear more Chinese but it can also Chinese, be detrimental to your people back home exactly so it, you seem you seem less adversarial is yeah, really what yeah it is. you basically be like they're like oh it's a it's a chinese person that's like ruling us yeah, not even, a mongol because the thing about you know all these asian guys is even to each other they all look the same so <laughs> as long as you dress chinese you look chinese right that was Apparently. Kublai. Just saying, we, man. We, we Just have saying, a, it's Kublai's We have a rule. European description of what the Mongols look like. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't quite remember what it was, but oh, they have a thousand different ones. They're all fucking short, uh, legs short below the knee, white in the face. You basically, destri- describe them all as being like short, stocky motherfuckers. Yeah, which makes sense. I, not really, though. I don't know. Does it make sense? Because they like. Um, I don't know how much diet and stuff like that has to do with your... I mean, it's just what they look like. A, a broad nose. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it seems it seems like not how they would look either, but whatever. Yeah, but... Uh, the stocky part it, makes sense because they're all always riding and always like doing stuff, so... Unless you're super die and then you're just a fat fuck. Yeah, fucking super. He's a genius though, but yeah, he was a fucking genius. He was like the next guy who was like just as good as uh, Genghis as far as tactics. Yeah. So Genghis, Um, one of the things he said before he he passed away is that he was a a great, um, you know, leader in in war times, and he found amazing people to help general, you know, his army in war times. But he was never good at peace times. He was never as good at getting things. That's why he was so worried about his sons, because he was like, hopefully this leads to a great peace amongst this whole area. And they need to know how to do this. But anyway, yeah, uh, Kublai is where things get really fucking cool uh, with the with Mongols. um, Because he's the one who introduces like education for the people. Um, he introduces like fucking public libraries, shit like, eh, eh, and really goes for the the paper money thing. Yeah, because um, gold was since, since they were so far out of the way, and gold was such a pain to trans, uh, to, you know, in transit. Yeah, because like um, bullions were paper. like really large chunks of gold. Right, it's, they were like basically, and it made it it made it safer. And yeah. so, and all these things, he did a, so much more to make things safer. He made roads. He had this, you know, Mongols patrol the roads, and to make sure that trade went to where you know his place, he paid more for goods, and he, I think he destroyed well, another Ogedai other cities. Ogodai was oh, the one who paid that. more to like okay. make sure that they, the people would come to the Mongols. Right. And then he also tried to destroy other areas to make it so they had to come to them instead of going over there. Yeah. Yeah. Take that, capitalism. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Free market my ass. The only market. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Free to kick your market's ass and take your shit. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. Uh, Brings a tear to the eye. The only market is the one you can defend. That's right. <laughs> 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 Libertarianism uh, realized. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but yeah, uh, Kublai is where like the trading stuff, which Cam Cam gets really uh, hard for, yeah. is like where they see it, this it is the Conan that I want. Th- yeah, it's the it's the thing that like what really took off. Like you know, it even influenced the. Uh, 
you know the the Western Europeans to like be more accepting of the Mongols because the instead of it being like a bunch of fear mongering like it was um, like in Ogadai's time mm-hmm. uh, for for Kublai Khan it was oh the they have all these you know um, carpets and cloth and all these like really good things that everybody wanted. Um, and, and so they became known for that, and so people looked more friendly towards them right. than they would have before. Uh, and yeah, he he's basically made every like modern advancement uh, after you know um, Genghis's death. Everybody kind of like idled, was still trying to take over stuff. But Kublai is where everything kind of they just went for it uh, for as society goes. Um, and he kept like the his um uh his his mongol culture even even with his palace cuz like he would sleep in gurs and stuff even like yeah it, next it was, to his palace like he would still do that shit right. cuz he was still a mongol yeah um which is really cool that he would like stay and do that um and one of the interesting things is like the city that he founded to be his capital in China as like its emperor w- ended up being, uh, it was like Beijing, I think. We're starting to branch, yeah, too. Yeah, it, it became one of those big cities. I think it was, I think it was Beijing. Yeah. But he, uh, and it was weird. He almost like assimilated with the uh, with the Chinese, and they it made him super powerful, and they. He he got a lot of technology from, from a lot of other nations. Like yeah. math started becoming a really big thing. Yeah, um, he, he like brought over a lot of technology to f- the, the like the Western Europeans um, from all the countries that he like had access to. Uh, and he also tried to create like a centralized alphabet that everybody could use to translate their languages to, so that ev- like it would be a lot easier to keep track of everything yeah which is a really insanely good idea for them yeah how make many, it easier like, to communicate how many make it cultures easier to were keep like track of stuff uh communicating at once with under the mongol rule yeah they had a shitload of people they started using paper money as well right that's yeah which is pretty fucking genius um because it's lighter easier to use less risk transporting yeah, they limited its spread so they didn't cause inflation and shit like that. Yeah, they knew they knew how to control the market, which is really yeah. crazy. Because like when you first come up with an idea like that, you you know, and the fact that like it could be used from you know China to Persia to the Islamic countries to even like Russia made it so that that was the, the, currency the merchants have. like immediately took use of that because it could be used everywhere and everyone could use it for any goods and service like at yeah. all yeah that's the that's the beauty of of dollars yeah and like who i thought it was really interesting seeing the accounts of dudes who were like visiting and were like well this is really interesting like that you know this paper money was accepted everywhere like uh they didn't really understand the concept yeah it's kind of similar to like some of the arguments for being pro european union like if you're in France, you could be right next to another country, and like if you go over there and buy something, like it's a pain in the ass to get, you know, to trade your dollars in for whatever their currency happens to be to buy in that country. Right. Whereas with the euro, they can all, you know, they can all kind of work together and have one currency that they all accept. I mean, kind of see, a little bit different though um, when it comes to the euro. I mean, yes, it's great to have one currency across all countries, but uh, it's kind of tying their economies together and some of those economies are not as strong as yeah, others yeah. and it really fucks with you know the the wealthier nations in a way yeah and i you know it almost reeks of multiculturalism as well which is but, like uh, everyone whereas should be one in, thing in this situation like, in this situation it was the mongol empire yeah and so yeah it has all so one currency worked, yeah and it was so large um the, well, I think at one point it was the largest empire. Yeah. Like yeah. even to this day, there hasn't been an empire as large I, as I much land as uh, the, the Mongols. The largest contiguous one. I think right. the the I think the English Empire was bigger land wise, but it was all over the place. They had America. They had England. They had they had parts of India, parts South of India, Africa. parts of South Africa. I think their the British Empire was bigger. But right. not it wasn't all one mass like this was. I think, I think so. This was the biggest thing they'd ever seen. 
Um, um, and then, yeah, so as far as that, that it was their economy, their currency, that was, you know, good for a huge area, so... And uh, they, you know, created their own weight measuring system and stuff like that and set defaults for that type of thing. Yeah. They they had, yeah, they had really regulatory, st- like, restrictions on money and stuff like that just to make sure that it kept, it stayed honest and stayed accurate uh, mm-hmm. so that it could function. Because you have to have those things for a society's monetary system to function at all, you know. And he was, he was a pretty, he was pretty badass. Didn't he they did call him of- the Golden Con? Yeah, because yeah, he, he started yeah. the golden age yep. thing, um, and he he educated everybody. He started making schools and stuff like that. Everyone free you know, education. Yeah, everyone or, got smarter. That doesn't sound like uh, that. Sounds more like socialism now. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. About Social that. libertarianism. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's like. You can, you think you can say it's good if you know the golden con does it. But if we try to do the same thing over here, all of a sudden it's socialism. And Ain't nobody who black. Who's gonna know. fucking pay for it? Well, I'm just I, joking, though. By the way. Yeah, I know who's gonna pay for it. I saw my freaking house taxes. <laughs> it's my ass. But uh, yeah, he did a lot of cool things like that, and like really cemented some of those older ideas that his grandfather had, like made them strict laws and you know it was a it was a lot of a lot of peacetime outside of their conquesting you know like within the oh, realm shit. like very very safe uh some yeah, of the safest the roads to travel time okay. ruler and he just like made everything i know we're all the way better. over to the golden con but i had a point that i forgot to bring up as part of the war tactics um from genghis khan um and later cons is when they uh, started conquering the uh, the Middle East and all those educated people that they would bring. That's and how literate everyone was. That was when they started propaganda machine. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I forgot the stuff. fucking propaganda. That was such a huge. The point. propaganda always made me laugh because you were like, "Yeah, we, we can we're going to write about how fucking, fucking terrible this shit. dude is. Yeah, how fucking terrible the Mongols are. Yeah, fucking keep pumping that shit out." And send it everywhere. It made everybody <clears throat> scared of them, so they were easier to Fuck. defeat and more susceptible to just like, <laughs> you know. And that up. just again goes to show how brilliant Genghis Khan was, as far as using all the tools that he was given. Every fucking tool. If you're an engineer, if you know how to do this, you know gunpowder, um, you know uh, engineering with you know catapults and fucking literacy itself just spreading propaganda and influencing the way people think through the written word. And it's fucking genius. Yeah. Every friend, every tool, he knew how to use it. Oh yeah. And Kublai Khan basically invented the printing press. Yeah. (laughs) Which is fucking nuts. Oh man. Kublai Khan did fucking everything. Uh, yeah, I forgot about the printing press press thing. That's yeah. He had like the, the shifting letters board or whatever that they could use, uh, to print whatever they wanted. Yeah. Because he wanted it to uh, make playing cards as well. Because <laughs> playing cards became like a huge thing. And they were like, all right, well, let's just make a shitload of playing cards instead of a bunch of copies of it's the Bible. It's just he's sitting here just like making his playing cards. Oh, this is great. Like, how'd you make them? Like, how, how long did it take to paint? Oh, we didn't paint. We just did this. And then yeah, some dude just, in the uh, back is like, just made a you, stamp. Just, you do this and then, you know, switch these out. And the guy's like, do you know what? Do you know what you've done here? He's like, yeah, I've made mo- no, tons of I fucking cool cards. cards. <laughs> yeah. I mean, <laughs> but you, you know what you could, uh, you know what else you could do with this, right? This is the greatest invention ever, potentially. Like <laughs> a lot of people consider the printing press that. So yeah, that's what they. I did. still say indoor plumbing is the best invention. Yeah, yeah. And if you find me, tell me, peeing in a fucking bowl under your bed is okay. <laughs> and that'd be convenient, but. But anyways. But yeah, so printing press. Is, uh, fuck, yeah, that playing cards thing made me laugh, dude. Yeah. Because it was like, oh yeah, we we did, he, he wanted to... This huge invention, but it was just for his His leisure. whole thing was like he wanted to revolutionize more trade. Yeah. So he tried to think of like more ideas that could be sold like from... Because he had access to a shitload of different cultures. Yeah. And, and he was like, you know, we probably have a bunch of stuff we haven't even thought about as being marketable to other people. Right. And then he's just like, oh, yeah, playing cards. Like, everybody can take some playing cards, but they can't take a board game. 
So you start like putting out more of these fucking playing cards, and everybody bought them because like they were easily taken around by everybody, right? Like the the people guarding merchants, like and yeah, all sorts of people. It was easy enough to play. There's a shitload of games you can play with. Want to play around a Gwent? <laughs> yeah, fucking Gwent. Yeah. And then, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and and it like outsold like the scriptures, like both of Islam and the Bible and whatever, <laughs> because like. They were like, you know what? Playing cards. That's the greatest thing ever. Everybody bought it. Yeah, you could take it with you as a soldier. <laughs> you know what shit. people value more than uh, religion? Fucking gambling. Let's fucking, fucking market true. this. true. I love it. Yeah. I love the Kublai Khan. It's like, yes, fucking playing cards. Yeah, I think after him is when it all went to shit, right? Pretty much. It started going downhill right after him. Well, because like, very slowly, that was the Golden Khan, and that was when his he's sons the Khan, but at only the same knew time, wealth and, and debauchery. Uh, he only controlled like a section of all of the Mongol territory. There were right. four other Khans at the time. Okay. Um, one ruling like the Russia area, one ruling like a majority of like where Mongol was and some of the Islamic countries. And, you know, uh, they all were like trading. Um, between each other, uh, and you know, while they were kind of like fighting each other, they're like, you know what, we also should be trading so that our, you know, right. our individual governments just don't shut down. So they they like kept trading and they were vaguely friendly to each other, but uh, yeah, it was it was really interesting that yeah. there was like kind of that power struggle going on, but they didn't really do anything about it. Because everything was still working. Yeah, and then after he after he died, that's when it all kind of descended into chaos again. Yeah. Um, which uh, is kind of the fall of an empire, uh, and you know it's they got destroyed. The Russians killed a shitload of them. Yeah, yeah. They like started the, getting assimilated more into the country. Yeah, the the Kublai, you know, that area, and they pretty much just assimilated with the Chinese. Uh, yeah, Chinese it, after it, in the while. Chinese, they basically got taken over because the uh, the original dudes who were ruling they could never um, unite. Yeah, the original dudes who were ruling kind of were like, you know, there's not that many of them, and they're fucking up with their policies because you know after Kublai Khan died, they're like, you know, we've been too kind to the Chinese people, so let's you know make sure they realize they're not Mongols. And so they started like oppressing them more and more. So the pre- previous rulers were like, Hey, this is our fucking opportunity. So they took over, pushed them out, kind of got rid of all their advanced policies, um, including the paper money idea. So everybody kind of just like reverted after the Mongols kind of disappeared and were like assimilated to various countries right. and cultures, which is really interesting and kind of sad, yeah. That they just like were like we're we're all gonna, of this that they had built. Defy everything that was Mongol in order to become our own thing again. <laughs> yeah, really but, fucking stick it to but, them. But liberals. they're basically like we're gonna dumb ourselves down again. <laughs> I'll show them. They gotta fucking stick it to them. <laughs> yeah, we ain't fucking Mongols. Oh, uh, you know, this fucking science shit. Fucking gay. Get that out of here. <laughs> yeah, you fucking. Yeah. Fucking uh, calculus nerd. What was the fucking counting machine again? The abacus. Abacus. You fucking abacus nerd. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you go get some pussy, you loser? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so then it just it, it just went to shit. Yeah, everyone kind of just, it just disappeared. It's weird. It started breaking down into smaller and smaller like groups again. Groups, yeah. And then they started getting assimilated into the the various countries. And they had to like constantly switch religions in order to appease whoever was starting to gain power um which was a really interesting idea yeah and that's kind of how it ends uh the book i i, I think it, it goes i think it's really interesting to look at empires like a little deeper than a lot of people do nowadays nowadays everyone's just a social justice warrior piece yeah. of shit and they're like oh it's so oppressive like oh it's this it's that it's like yeah it is by nature but at the same time, like it, it brings all these securities and all these niceties to our way of life. Like we don't suffer nearly as much as we used to. Like you might be able to tell yourself that you're being super it's, oppressed, uh, but it's like we're not being oppressed by nature itself. And it's killed. when your all your basic necessities are uh, met. It's just you have to have you make things up. You to make get things mad about. <laughs> yeah, 
you know, dangerous political world to, to push that topic. But yeah, you invent yeah. you invent all sorts of different things that aren't real to uh, you know make problems out of. Yeah, you do. You really do. Yeah, it's, it takes you back to the you know easy times make uh, weak people. Yeah. Um, You're all fucking weak. No, just kidding. You I guys, was, uh, you guys are great. I was going to get online. Yeah, you listen to us. I was going to get online right. and complain the other day, but sarcastically about how my fucking Roomba pulled my internet cable out of the fucking router. Did it actually? Just, yeah. <laughs> it was. Did you? Did you? Fucking did you beat my it? robot vacuum <laughs> disconnected me in the middle of a game. <laughs> I fucking can't live in this world. Yeah. Yeah, your your robot maid fucking. Do you have like a French <laughs> turned maid off your access the to the world? <laughs> you should get some frilly <laughs> panties. How and can they fucking <laughs> market this fucking vacuum robot? And, and it can't even your, fucking you not know to do Roomba that. Up like the uh, the robot from the Jetsons. Yeah, yeah. Oh, fuck, what's that? Root? What's her name? Rosie. Rosie. Rosie yeah, the okay. robot. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna have like a fucking backup Roomba that I have in like a closet somewhere, and then uh, and uh, fucking hook it up to my Google Home, and then with my fucking uh, Hue light bulbs and stuff like that, fucking tape a knife to this fucking Roomba, and then like Google. Uh, okay, Google, go sicko mode, and then fucking. Like uh, synth wear and you know, like fucking hardcore, you know, synth wave music starts fucking, you know, blaring. The lights start flashing, uh, you know, red and stuff like that. And then fucking Roomba opens the closet door with the fucking knife on it and starts doing 360s <laughs> and stuff like that. Yeah. I like the I like the one meme I found where it was like someone said, you know, you want to get crazy, like turn out all the lights, put a claim around the Roomba and like set it off. <laughs> When someone goes into your house, like someone yeah. invades your house. But wouldn't, so the whole idea about <laughs> fucking, room fucking claymores. claymores, like the whole thing about fucking claymores <laughs> is it's, uh, it, it's, it's just a light wire at that point. And when it notices the, the wire has been cut or triggered, it's going to blow up. So the fucking Roomba moving is going to explode the fucking claymore. Yeah, I guess you could make it like a laser thing. But then what would you have the laser beam bounce off if of? If it's moving around, it's going to blow up. Yeah, whatever the reflector, whenever it disconnects from the reflecting It would device. have to be fucking somehow, you would either have to have to, to, to build more into it, like like facial or recognition camera on it as well. So when it sees something, then it blows up. Yeah, something like that. Uh, I, I like this book, though, for that reason, because yeah. it shows For that, fucking Roombas. For Roomba Claymores, yeah. That's, with, that was the biggest... Without fucking Genghis Khan, we wouldn't have this. the biggest surprise. Yeah, it's the, the all fucking, about fucking taking technologies from different peoples and putting them together. You, the Claymores you wouldn't have Germans. gotten you fucking got the Roombas the Roomba Claymores that without shit it. Right after World War II. You got the Roombas from Snapped the Japanese. Up them krauts. Yeah. We're going to the fucking moon, and you're taking us there. That's right. And they they sent the fucking Ruba claymores under the walls because they were small <laughs> enough to rage, and they just fucking slaughtered with the little Ruba claymores. <laughs> now that I, I I like how oh, it, it, the the real thing that actually destroyed the the Mongol Empire was the Black Plague, which I thought was really oh yeah that was a big one yeah because like the the plague started I guess in in Asia and then kind of moved over with like the rats and whatever. Um, and it was their their but, roots but it, that like, caused a lot. Yeah, of it. It like fucked up the like the trade, and because they couldn't trade anymore, they weren't getting as much money. And because so they, they don't have any, na- they don't have any natural resources other than their horses that they don't trade. They don't yeah. have anything. And so this is like this well, is they a didn't true... actually like mine or anything. Yeah. in their own country. They just kind of did it. Well, from yeah. The surrounding it, so areas. they basically went from a conquering nation to a trading nation, where they got their wealth being the trade. Trading exactly, center. They made yeah. money off of all that fucking trade. Now, when the Europeans started fucking dying, there was no more Europeans wanting to buy shit and no more money. That and they were dying too. Yeah. Well, yeah. the Black Plague killed a lot it of fucking killed people. Yeah. Especially, yeah, it's, uh, down in the China area where it's also humid. So Yeah, it just festers. It just I don't grows. think, uh, like, how many people actually died in the steppe lands because of it, though? Like how how much did the, uh, did the did, Russian it Mongols It did say die? that it, uh, there were some, but because of how spread out the Mongol people usually are we like with their tents and shit. Um, not many because yeah. they weren't yeah. right next to each other like they were in. Like, but then, English towns when the and, more powerful Golden Khan and his Khan or that area died, then they didn't have that defense anymore, and so the Russians could ride in. Yeah, yeah, and they just got they, they just give got them to the guns. Dominated, yeah, <laughs> gave them to the guns. 
Um, mm-hmm. I, I I like I like looking at things a little bit more fairly. I mean, these these empires do have the ability to oppress and like, but they also have the ability to bring things up. And I mean, I think I think it's pretty ungrateful to look at things you from have the ability to oppress. <laughs> Use I think it. it's yeah. I think it's pretty. I think it's pretty ungrateful. It's a very ungrateful thing to look at something like like this Mongol Empire and only see it for its downsides. Um, it's ungrateful and it's honestly no, dishonest. No, it's just... Because it's, just, it's not the whole truth. I, I just don't like it when people... There's a there's a lot cherry of pick things of out of history misinformation too, where there's a whole bunch Mongols of things go. that happen and then you, you know, you have to take it... You can't take someone doing these things out of context, you know, what was happening, you know, at those times, like it, the book did explain, you know, Hey, you know, there was worse shit going on. Doesn't make what he did. Okay. But without Genghis Khan, a lot of the stuff that, you know, you saw today, you know, society wouldn't have happened the way it did. Yeah. So I, I, I think it's important to take a step back and realize that that's, that's always true. Take 10 steps back and go fuck yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean... Um, there's another historical character that people like to do that to. I'm not saying that he wasn't, you know, you know, bad guy at, at times, but you can't, you know, attribute 150 years of bad history to one person. You yeah. There's that, and then also, I think people are pretty disingenuous, and it's really easy to to lay judgment when you're looking up at somebody. So like I and I think I've I've really started to realize this is kind of true. Like all of us have the capacity to do some of these terrible things. We just don't have the tools to do them, right? Right. Like you look at all these super rich people that cheat on their wives and have affairs and like have you know these with these women that are like amazing looking and stuff. And it's like, oh, how could they do that? It's like, well, no, everyone could do that, but no one but them can because they're in that position. So to me. Everyone has the capacity to do some of these things. Maybe we have the will to suppress that, or maybe we don't have the opportunity. Period. So it's easy to pass to like pass judgment on someone for doing something that you say you wouldn't do, but it's easy for you to say you wouldn't do it because you will never have the opportunity to do it because of who you are and what you've done and what you aspire to. I think that makes a lot more sense to look at things that way. What do you think? So it's not, it's not, it's false. I really have to unpack what you said because there's like. It's not false. It's, it's not. So again, it, this is kind of, you know, a product of the time. And then like he wasn't 100% a, a good person. I mean, you know, well, no one, died, no one is. But you can't, you know, justify, you know, current acts. I'm not justifying so. anything. I'm saying that anyone has the capacity to do things to people that are horrible but right. we don't have the means to do it, and so we don't. So that's not us being better than them. That's us not having the means. Well, and there are there are there are ways. So to, you're just saying that someone who would go basically on a mass. <laughs> if you so you're just saying if someone who would go on a mass shooting, but because of current gun control laws, they can't get the gun to do so, just because they you know they wanted to go on a mass shooting but they just didn't have the means to do so no i'm saying the me the reason them wanting to do is the problem okay but if you think about it if you think look, so like here's a good way to here's a good way to think about this like what would you what would you do to the worst possible person that you've ever thought of if you there were no repercussions to it and i'm pretty sure you can think of some terrible things to do to people right but there are repercussions, so we don't do it. But if you are Genghis Khan, there are no repercussions. Yeah, but if they don't find out. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. You, we all have these fucking, we all have these evil ideas and these things that and, we can do that are terrible. I mean, what is evil? What is good? Just it's, society has decided what is evil and what is good. No, I think everyone is both. And I think it's pretty clear if you just, you know, because we look evil, at ourselves. We look at ourselves and, you know, you decide... You, 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 we think we're okay. We're decent people, as long as you operate within. Well, <laughs> within what the structures of a corrupt society is that yeah. good? I mean, that's what we're basing ourselves off of. But like I said, what is good changes over time. What is acceptable changes over time. I don't it also know. Changes culturally too. Because it does. There are some things that are like looked upon as being bad in some cultures and not in others. I mean, I have a whole D and D campaign written just off of this. 
Yeah. The whole moral gradient where your society has decided what is moral and what is just and what isn't. And um, if you throw all those away, you have, you know, the only laws that matter, which are the laws that govern the universe. Yeah. Just because you do a thing doesn't make it inherently good or evil. It's just what society has said is good or evil. Yeah, but that doesn't it isn't necessarily true either because if you live in a terrible place, it doesn't matter what they think is good because they do terrible things like killing people or, you know. If you look at like the Didn't sapiens kind of go over this this uh, this kind of concept as well? Yeah, a little bit. So, I think it's I think I don't know, it's almost like we all have it's it's like what uh shit, there's one of the there's a comedian um that joked about this. He's like, you know, Everyone likes to make fun of Tiger Woods and be like, oh, he's such a terrible person for sleeping with all these people when he's married. But it's like, you know, when you go to the golf course, you don't have 30, 20-year-old hot blondes waiting to fuck your brains out when you get through everyone, the 18th I hole. I mean, yes. Okay. And so it's easy to say. Everyone knows Everyone knows that cheating, I guess in our current society, cheating is morally wrong. It's bad. But you're right. Have you considered putting yourself in that situation? How would how would you react? And it's, I mean, I've been put in situations where I thought I wouldn't do a thing, but uh, ended up doing a thing. And yeah, I feel bad about it. It's because you had the power to do it, right? But you think no, you would like to think that you wouldn't. But then when you have that opportunity, when you have that ability, it's not really what you think it is. So it's like a, it's like a false. It's a it's like a false sense of morality that people have because they're. They're never going to have that opportunity, so they can mock someone or they can well, talk down to someone that yes took the chance no. that they never had. Yes and no, and it's it's the. I mean, you you, it, you're just saying just you can't you know come at everything that someone does and say, well, would you do the same in that situation? Because that's outside. I mean, I don't know. That, there's a lot to. I'm not saying that everyone there. would do the same in every situation. I'm saying that you can't tell. You can't say that you wouldn't because you you've never had that opportunity. It's, I it's, mean, it's, some people can be pretty strong in their opinion that they wouldn't. Yeah, but I don't, they, it doesn't matter because it's not true. But, but how, does that val- that. how does that let that other person off the hook, though? It doesn't let them off the hook. I'm not saying it does. I'm saying but, that... But I guess you're more or less saying, you know, as, as, you know like a Twitter call-out culture type of thing where, yes, he did something wrong. Yes, he's going to pay the consequences for it. But you can't keep going on a tirade like you've never been in that situation before. Type of thing. Why yeah. exactly are we arguing about I have this? No idea. Well, it's it's the uh, it's it's the argument of Genghis Khan. It's oh, it's just like I don't know. What do you See, mean? It's the argument of Genghis. Khan? I mean, well, it's a lot of people killing, a lot of killing people, hundreds, you know, killing thousands and thousands of people was still a bad thing to do in that time. But people in power in that time still did it. Yeah, it's the well. It's some the, people did things more, you know, grotesque. I guess I his motivations say. for doing it were and, better than most, but so, it still doesn't make it good. And uh, he, I don't know, like he did kill thousands, and thousands of people, but like the stories of how bad he was might have been blown out of proportion. His fault because he liked that because it you know stopped people from you know rebelling and stuff like that. Yeah, but he was. I mean, you you can't say Genghis Khan was overall a good person. All you know at the end of it all, um, he did a lot of things that you know society benefited from for sure. But he still killed thousands and thousands and thousands of people. Well, I don't think there are any good people. But again, at that I think point that's a of really time, stupid way to look mm, at the world. Because everyone, everyone does things that are not is, good. So, okay, I would say... Nobody's perfect. For the most the thing, part. Right? I would say for the most part. Yeah, no one's perfect. I would say for the most part, a lot of people put themselves before others. They are their number one thing to do. But there are people out there who are, you know, not that way. They tend to... Um, there's iconically good people who we have seen throughout history, and they stand out because it's against the norm. Yeah, but, I mean, there's... There, there's also a certain sense of like self-preservation that is good as well. So it's also right. counter good to be so unconcerned about your own well-being that you die from it. Well, because yeah, then all I mean, the that's, that you've you're, done you're sticking that example of extremes, though. Um, well, you're talking about the extremes. You're talking about the people that are genuinely good. I'm just good. saying there are genuinely good that's people out there. That's a pretty fucking there. extreme thing. How, the, the, not too extreme. It's not like, um, oh, it, you're going to let yourself die maybe if you were in that sort of a dire situation an actual good person would sacrifice themselves so someone else doesn't have to die if you're in that situation they would probably make that decision um but 
you have, you know, other icons of people who are, you know, for the most part good, but then you get into you know, online, and you could start dissecting their character. And yes, there are some morally great decisions that that person has made. They are a hundred percent good. Um, but you can't, you know, say your own preservation is not on the side of good anymore. You can't conflate the two. It's if you just put a person in a situation and a good example I've seen online is, you know, um, I guess more or less, they've had some studies like Vsauce did some things on on his channel where you were trying to gauge the moral compass of someone. And yeah, people are in a gray zone and people make decisions, you know, that other people would make. You just can't, you know, there are good people out there who wouldn't make that decision given that opportunity. Yeah, no, it's obviously there are good people out there that wouldn't. But I guess this is kind of, you know, degrading into, I mean... I mean, this is another thing where I want to talk to you about, you know, the whole libertarian idea. It relies too much on people being good people. Well, it's not, it's not, it's not the whole idea behind the let the free market decide. Well, that's not about people being good. That's about people being self-interested and that's what makes the market work. Right. Um, it's but that's, that's a different, good. different conversation that we can, like, I, I feel like I agree with a lot with, you know, the libertarian idea, but it, you know, the regulations, you know, how the system will self-regulate depends too much on people giving a fuck. Well, it's not necessarily that they give a fuck. It's that they are looking out for themselves. And if everyone's doing that, it works. Yeah. But a lot of people, the, that's can what overlook, the stock market is. A lot is, of people and, can overlook things when they have money is the thing though overlook things what do you mean like uh, uh this is another conversation we uh, we're talking about you oh. know this well book. yeah but we can record that if people want us to record that yeah i just with Genghis, it's it's easy to like you know it's easy to say you'd never do those things and to easily classify him as a bad person but it's like he did a lot it's of hard, great things yeah. so he did a lot of great things it's just like you can't you can't really do that and be taken seriously you can't not but you just can't anyway. come out and say, yeah, so you can, again, with the current culture, you, someone is not always going to be 100% good or 100%, you know, 100% bad. You know, good people fuck up all of the time. And current culture today is when you find that fuck up, um, then you call them out for it. And now you can't, you can't, dis, you, you disregard every good thing this person has ever done because of that one fuck up. Yeah, it's so dumb. Yeah. And that is dumb. That's the whole call out culture. We're all human. We all make fucking mistakes. Um but it's kind of hard to apply that same idea to Genghis Khan because you can't objectively say he was a good person, but you can't objectively say that he Well, I don't really think there's any value in discussing whether or not he's right. a good person or not. But uh, people will disregard, you know, the things he has done, especially because of the amount, because of of the amount of people killed, especially it's in that area. If you like go a... to China and, you know, talk to like, you know, rural Chinese, you know, around that area, he was a terror. He was someone you know a despicable person type of thing yeah but that is more you know history slash stories that's also being passed propaganda down, that was spread in china by yeah. the guys who took over after the mongols were removed from power yeah and then you have to consider like how much were their lives worse or better after genghis khan i mean the ones that died obviously they weren't better but all the right. ones that lived and prospered they were quite a bit better, and you can say the same thing about a lot of our systems. Like a lot of people have a lot of problems with it, but it's like, hey, look, yeah, it's the it's world's kind of a like a way better a place. Term evil versus a long term good, yeah, which is like a weird thing. To which is consider. better? Which is better? And I would say the long term. I don't know. Every time, it's really hard to say. It's not justifying the short term. Just evil. because it, it's it's kind of hard to look at history and say whether or not things were justified because if he didn't do the things he did then we wouldn't be living in the society that we are today yeah that's true it could be similar but not quite the same thing yeah it's not i i just think there's more to it than good or bad i think yeah. good or bad is like yeah lazy um well it would have taken a lot longer for like the western uh you know um europe to to get like the technology and so i tend to because of the I mean, I feel like more people should do this. This is, you know, you know, just because we enjoyed this book and we really enjoyed the things that, you know, came about because of Genghis Khan, we can really get involved in the story and his ingenious in battle doesn't mean we objectively think that what everything he did was good. But I, again, I just don't think that should be part of the discussion. When you try to, you know, grandstand and say what happened in history is a good thing or a bad thing, 
it's just something that happened and we should just let it go at that trying to apply our current day morals to past situations is this is not something you can do um i think what happened happened and you can learn from it yeah i don't know i don't know if i believe that i think that's wrong but i don't think it's because it's our current day nor morals i think it's just morals as a whole i mean certain things will change but like, I don't know if everyone, anyone, really ever truly believed that slavery was like good, you know. And there were a lot of people yeah. that didn't there like were, slavery. There were, so though. slavery has changed, you know, the idea. There were people that really liked it, but that doesn't um, necessarily it, I mean, mean if you can compare slavery there's, as it was, you know, different versions of yeah. slavery throughout history. I mean, like the European countries had like serfdom, where they weren't slaves. It was but pretty they were much just the same part thing, of the yeah. land, so they just they weren't even considered. People slavery changes they depending on the culture it happens things. and yes on a whole slavery is not a good thing yeah and i don't yeah. i don't know if anyone truly ever thought it was so i have a hard time back in the time that. again it was they, they might was have common. accepted it as a part of life but life isn't good necessarily like for the most part back then everyone was dying and starving yeah. to death and freezing to death because life fucking sucked it only hasn't sucked for like a really small amount of time Considering the like whole lifespan of like mankind, it's been pretty shitty for a really long time. And only the last like couple hundred years, it's been pretty good for yeah. a lot of people, or as opposed to just pretty good for a few people. Yeah. So like I don't know. That's I don't know. That's just where I'm looking at it from. It's just I don't. know. It's not quite. It, and it does change. Like perceptions of it change, but I don't know if the underlying like ideas really have changed because a lot of these stories that you know, our, our cultures are based on are super, super fucking old and they've been kind of moved and tweaked and adjusted over time. But like they, they have roots back to like Mesopotamia. I'm just shit. saying, yeah. So I don't think it's just because all culture, I think the way they, they approach those, you can recognize those rules and how ideas. much that Genghis Khan has done to shape the modern world and the making of the modern world um, <laughs> the without having to acknowledge or, you know, talk about whether or not, he was a good person or not yeah he did what he did and we you know society progressed from that yeah that's over and if you want to talk about the morals of what he did i mean you can but it's doesn't change you know what happened afterwards yeah that's that's kind of what i'm saying too i'm saying like it's it's a dumb argument to be like oh well he was just a monster and it's like yeah it's it's kind of irrelevant it's like uh you know i read that nikola tesla book yeah and you know he Nikola Tesla did a lot of shit. He invented a lot of stuff that we use today and was like adapted to stuff that we use now. But like nobody ever talks about how he was a really shitty negotiator, was not good with money in any way, was kind of a huge dick bag. Yeah. And like, you know, nobody talks about any of that. They're yeah. just like, you know, he was he invented a bunch of shit. Yeah. Or they're like, haha, he made a death ray. Which he probably did. Nobody actually knows. Yeah. Except for the U.S. government. No one can confirm or deny yeah, the existence so. of the death ray. Well, his uh, his death ray stuff is still being held by the U.S. government. Right. So. And what if uh, exist. What if his uh, uh, what if a uh, current does. crowd management technology like the uh, microwave device that makes people feel like they're burning alive is just a a powered down version of his death ray? Could be. He Turned also was experimenting with a bunch of like. Uh, x-ray type shit which is what led to the death ray and he uh he almost gave himself cancer by doing that shit because he would like experiment with the lasers on himself <laughs> he would, like get burns <laughs> giving yourself for a while terminal uh radiation is, sickness slash cancer is kind of a kind of a thing that scientists did in that time yeah they had know, to around test, uh, the whole they had to test on themselves early you know, time our, of x-ray you know, radiation our, uh, and our plutonium. modern medicine wouldn't be as good as, as it is if the german you know scientists didn't fucking ex- do human experimentation that's true yeah some evil yeah. disgusting yeah. shit but yeah they and also you, advanced like medicine I said, we like, wouldn't have gotten to the moon a lot <laughs> We wouldn't have gotten to the moon if it wasn't for those same German scientists yeah. as well. Well, uh, yeah. one of the other things cool that... Uh, so this is something that, that Jordan Peterson got that I like a lot. He and so, I like, mean, I don't know. He says the look at history as the, as the oppressor and not the oppressed. And his biggest example is like in Nazi Germany and like Soviet Russia, almost everyone was either 
implicit or complicitly involved with what was going on. In Soviet Russia? In both. Like in, Russians in were turning people in. They were turning right. in everybody. Germans were turning in their neighbors. Yeah, and so reporting on your own family members. That yeah. was huge. So the you can't look at you if you're if you were there, you would be part of that, most likely. Probably. Because if you look at how many Oscar Schindlers there were and how many very not Oscar Schindler. But uh, like, put yourself in that situation. It's more of, a f- again, the fear of self-preservation <laughs> and preserving your family. But see, no, the thing is, though, with Nazi Germany, that wasn't that wasn't a thing for most of it. It wasn't fear of, it wasn't, there wasn't. They were uh, having some good times. You're right. They were living in, the, yeah. No, I mean, it wasn't, it, it wasn't, wasn't it was, fear of. They were living, so it was their, you know, poor, you know, not, you know, Germany, where they were still dealing with the, you know, the war reparations that they had to make. Their fucking currency was worthless. Everyone was, you know, it was, you know, everyone was super poor. And then you had this one dude nationalist who was really, you know, working people up, you know, wanting to make Germany great again. Yeah. And then uh, basically got a following from that. And it was that and the promise of a better life that made everyone support it and then as, as as soon as you know that was happening i don't know how I, I would have to look at something to really see if the life of the individual german got better during the whole you know early phases of the war during you know part of the war up until they started being pushed back um but yeah it was a promise of a better life that kind of made the average german behind it but the weird thing is is like i've got a book that you should read it's really good it's about this and it was kind of you know the the sanctions against germany that uh, after World War One, yeah, kind of started World War Two. Yeah. So, but it's like it, within the society, like it wasn't really pressure, like it wasn't like a threat, like you do this or we'll kill your family. That was more of like a Russian thing, you know. You retreat and we'll shoot you. Yeah, that was the Germans. The it was Army, no yeah. one was saying no. Everyone was like, everyone was like convincing each other that this was the right thing to do, even though they knew it wasn't true to some level and that and was so what that was the book you're, you're 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 talking about was the average you know this normal dude police force that yeah, turned yeah. into the uh, ss and they like, didn't killers. they weren't forced to do it at all right. never were they forced they were they only force the enforcement came through like did they start to to really believe in the Aryan stuff they were some of them some of them did yeah some of them went balls deep and like they would just love killing people they'd get super shit face and make a game out of it a bunch of people were disgusted by it and some people told them i guess they that when you're put in a situation like that where the limits of your you know, your imagination can be explored in that way um who you become do you and that could be i guess a measure of your character when yeah. you have no rules who yeah. are you but if you don't have that situation you have no business telling people that you're better than they are because you haven't done the things that they've done I think that's really just moral grandstanding, and it's you you making you patting yourself on the back for not doing something you never had the chance to do. And that's fucking weak. That makes you your character weaker. But that's I don't know. It, it's just so annoying to me to see people like, oh well, I would never do that. And it's like, well, you're a fat slob. Like, of course you'd never do that. You'd never have any of those hot, you know, twenty five year olds wanting to fuck your brains out at the end of the golf course because you probably would have a heart attack halfway through the fucking golf course. I, I gotta tell you, that'd probably be a good way to go. That well, yeah. If you knew they were there, at least you could then like fantasize in your last moments about making, or just you get them. You know, that'd be pretty sweet. Yeah, Heart attack that, as you, <laughs> you, would, you would. That's how you die. Is like you get them. Yeah, yeah. But I, I don't know. It, it's, it's really, it's really tough. And the German thing is like totally different, and the Russian thing is way different too um, than the the Genghis thing. Yeah, but it's. I think that is an interesting way to look at history, though, is as if you were the ones perpetrating it, as opposed to being the ones destroyed. And it doesn't really work as much with Genghis Khan as it does with, like, Russia or Germany, because, like, there were a lot of people uh, doing the things. Um, and the gang, the the cons, like, it was like, well, if your city said no, then you were going to die anyway. So it's, like, it's hard to hard to look at it quite the same way. Yeah. But, I don't know. This book is really good, though. It has a lot of yeah, interesting no, things. Like, seriously, this was my favorite book for a long time. It, so. it's, it was a really good read. I liked both the introduction to it and the afterward that the uh, the author included in there, where he like talked about how you know the the Mongol people kind of got fucked over by the the rest of the world because you know they created this like fiction that the Mongols were responsible for every bad thing that ever happened. Yeah. Uh, and even going as far as like creating this whole 
the mongoloid <laughs> thing, <laughs> yeah. which was really interesting to me. Like they, yeah, the they viewed like retarded children or people with Down syndrome as being like not of the, you know white race and being asian mongols instead right it's just like oh okay yeah so they were like the world's adversary to for a long time they're like the antagonist to the world and yeah and then like the russians like cut them off from their own like sacred grounds and so they couldn't even like go find like genghis's body or anything or yeah they yeah, couldn't find like his standard the, like they kept it from them forever to, like his flag because they thought that they were going to be like rebellious and try to take over again because you know the russians controlled mongolia yeah there was uh, a lot of crazy stuff that happened yeah it, they kind of got fucked over like in modern times because that shit. yeah yeah, yeah. And a lot see of, again a lot of the racism towards how is the it Asians how was is it uh, morally okay to hold descendants of the mongols uh responsible for the things that happened before it's yeah. interesting a yeah a lot of the I islamic just... countries hated them too because they were like oh they, yeah. they fucked islam they only they hated all of islam it's like no they really didn't a lot of they them didn't hate any religion were islamic especially yeah. by the end it's i don't know that's that's one of the problems with the whole like the whole like group responsibility thing is like sometimes it doesn't just stop with like a family it's it's like a whole culture of people right and then it's like then you are blamed for everything that's ever happened and it gets even it gets even weirder when it's like america because it's like we're not even the same people at all like it's it's such a loose thing to base it on like we're all responsible for like i don't know like slavery back in the day it's like my family wasn't even over here for the first like 400 years like Fuck you! I'm not responsible yeah, we're for that shit. Blamed for it because we kept like, slavery going longer than everybody else. Yeah, that's really the only reason. It's like, yeah, it might be white, but it's not like we're all like, it's not like white versus black. Mostly, it's white versus white all the time. Like in Europe, it's just white people killing each other, enslaving each other. Rome, it was fucking white people enslaving each other, enslaving black people. Everybody was fucking slaves. And like it's so dumb, and it's it's just not fair, right? It's the what the what the Russians did to him. It's like it's not really fair to hold him accountable for something, especially because it was like hundreds of years ago. It's just it just doesn't make sense. And at least for them, they, they were still Mongolians. It was like a particular people, not just a certain hue of fucking flesh that was to blame. But it's still just as weak and just as like much of a waste of time to blame stuff on them. And they, it, man, that reminds me of the Civ Five when I had the Mongol Horde, but I was really drunk and I never used the it. The original Zerg Rush. And you guys had fucking <laughs> tanks and shit, and it was bad, man. The original Zerg. Yeah. <laughs> there was no chance. Actually, A4 in the chat, they sold them to the Spanish, and the Spanish sold them to America. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I don't know. It's... This book brings up a lot of great points, though, and it like plays with a lot of these big ideas about like what empires are and what they consist of, and what they the bad sides and the good sides. Uh, mostly, mostly the good sides with this, but we all know the bad sides. You know, we've seen it over and over again. So it's kind of a refreshing, uh, refreshing take. But I would also remember that there's a lot of terrible shit that goes along with it too. Um, you can't really separate those two. But yeah, their biggest problem was treating it as like a. Uh... Uh, as a family related you know being able to take over next where he's like no it should be the person who actually deserves it instead but the family still fought over it and that's kind of what caused all their real problems outside of the black plague just like fucking them in the yeah end. yeah that's true all right, well, damn, this is the longest episode of After Dark by a lot. I knew it was going to be. There was well, no I mean, avoiding yeah, it's, it. It's, it's not even After Dark, really. It's our book club. Yeah, book club, which is not After Dark, even though we opened that way, just because we don't have an opening for it yet. So if you are musically inclined, uh, we will uh, All right, hold on. We send out a, a name. Yeah, what's see. a name? What are we going to call this? What, what, what's a good name for like a dirty book bookstore? Um, I don't know. Flesh markets. What? Uh, paperback flesh market. <laughs> uh, okay, we might need to take a second to uh, borders. <laughs> think of this. <laughs> that was a good name. Now it's not. But <laughs> um. 
Yeah, we'll come up with something. If you guys want to do a yeah. separate thing, I just... Thinking about hardback. Instead of paperback, <laughs> yeah, you could do more with the word hard. The book with a thousand backs. <laughs> Bareback book reviews. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. Bareback book reviews after dark. <laughs> but not actually gay, but, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> it's funny sounding. I don't know. We'll We'll come up with something. We'll come up with something. Yeah. Um, do you want me to? Yeah, I guess. I guess. Do who's next? Are we gonna do alphabetical? Uh, so you. If it's me, then the book is Musashi. Just so you guys know. Okay. <laughs> All right. We'll think about do it. it. Um, but uh, we'll probably tweet out or do something. Let you guys know what the next book is gonna be. But uh, we Musashi. should probably wrap this one up. It's going to be Musashi with yeah. me, regardless. Agreed. Um, yeah, thanks for hanging out, guys. Musashi. Hopefully you're still here, and we will see you later. <laughs>